Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, the national anthems of the Philippines and Japan. The two of them died. Please be seated. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Konnichiwa, minasama. I'm Professor Jocelyn Ocelero. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this special lecture on Philippines-Japan relations in celebration of the 101 years of academic and research linkages uh, between the University of the Philippines and the University of Tokyo, among other Japanese universities. And to formally welcome all our distinguished guests, faculty and students who uh, signed up for this event, I'd like to call on the Dean of the UP Asian Center, Dr. Henelito A. Sibilia Jr. to give us the opening remarks. Dean Sibilia. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Silero. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the special lecture on the Philippine-Japan religion, uh, relations via webinar. Time has passed by quite swiftly from the time when Dr. Matsunami Haichiro of the Tokyo Imperial University gave a series of lectures on Japan in 1920 up to this very present time. Japan at the time was in the most interesting, if not brave period of the so-called era of Taishu democracy where parliamentary politics under the Meiji constitution showed many signs of blossoming into a regime of relative liberal democratic role. 
At the same time, the Philippines was still very much a, colo a colony of the United States of America. And the Philippine Commonwealth has yet to be established in 1935. The so-called independence movement was in full gear, populated by the political elite composed of illustrators educated in Europe and associated with the so-called ancient regime of Spain and the pensionados, a new elite class that has emerged from the group of scholars who earned their degrees in the United States of America. Although the University of the Philippines had already existed in 1908, the field of Asian studies or even that of Japan studies has yet to emerge. Dr. Matsunami's lecture was therefore way beyond its time. One may however say that it planted the first seeds of East to East cooperation in the field of research and academic linkages. Here at the, uh, the Asian Center University of the Philippines, Diliman, we are most fortunate to have a roster of excellent specialists on Japan studies, all of whom have benefited from scholarships and grants from the Japanese government. First of all, we had the honor of having the services of Dr. Josefa M. Saniel, who established Japanese studies as a graduate degree in the University of the Philippines in the 1960s. Dr. Saniel is known as the mother of Japanese studies in the Philippines and is one of the first Filipinos to do research in Japan in the 1950s. She became Professor Emeritus and eventually was awarded on May 29, 1986, the third class order of the precious crown by His Majesty the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government. Second, in the 1989, Silvano Dong Mahiwo joined the Asian Center as assistant professor. He eventually obtained his PhD in international relations from Tokyo University in 1991. One of the many works he is known for is Junction Between Filipinos and Japanese, a book which he edited together with renowned anthropologist Arnold Azorin. Third, we have Michio Yoreno Ries, who joined the Asian Center in the 1999 and served until 2016. She earned his Doctor of Philosophy in Philippine Studies from the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy, University of the Philippines, Diliman, in 2011. Apart from Japanese culture, of course, and society, she is a renowned expert on the Salidumai tradition of Sadaga Asagada Mountain Province. Fourth, we also have Matthew Constantio Santa Maria, who joined the Asian Center in 2003, having earned his Doctor of Law degree in political science from the Kyoto University Graduate School of Law in 1999. Apart from the themes of law and religion, ethnic conflict and cultural studies, Dr. Santa Maria is known for his research on Sama Bajau studies. And finally, of course, but surely not the last of our recruits in the rosters of Japanese studies experts, is our very own MC, Dr. Jocelyn Silero, joined our faculty in 2018 after finishing her PhD in international studies from Waseda University, Tokyo, Japan. She is an expert in migration policy and related issues as well as Philippine-Japan relations. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to declare that all of the scholars that I have mentioned have done to contribute to Philippine-Japan relations through their scholarship, collaborative engagement, and individual advocacies. The works exemplify the most important role of the Asian Center as the bridge of the Philippines to Japan and to the rest of Asia. 
The Asian Center vows to continue to expand and to strengthen its Japanese studies program through the recruitment of experts to join its roster and faculty members, through the continued establishment of linkages with Japanese universities and research institutes, and through collaborative engagement, such as the very one we have here or we have today. This commitment is not only academic in nature, but has great ramification in our very own pursuit of international understanding, cross-cultural communications, and that very elusive idea or condition of world peace. I would like to thank Dr. Toro Nakanishi, Professor of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences of the University of Tokyo for being our featured speaker today. Undoubtedly, we will learn quite a lot from his observations about the past 40 years of research and inter-university linkages between Japan and the Philippines. I would also like to point out the fact that his very own experience as scholar shows the academic collaboration between the two countries is indeed a two-way direction or street. I also would like to thank Dr. Michio Yoreno Rios and Dr. Maria Rosario Chiri Piquero Valiescas for sharing their expertise as reactors of today's lecture. And of course, I also would like to thank Director Bean Suzuki of the Japan Foundation in Manila for their support to the Asian Center activities on Japan or Japan studies in the past years, the present, and of course, I expect in the future. Finally, I would like to thank you all who without fail, always attend our webinar and various other events. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat po at mabuhay tayong lahat. Back to you, Dr. Thank you very much, Dean Sibilia, for that very heartwarming message. And it was more than a welcoming address to, well, you know, to grace, to, to kick off this um, public lecture event that we have. And truly, this is a celebration more than, you know, a, a look back on the achievements of Japan-Philippine relations, at least uh, for the most part in the recent years, in more into uh, university to university and student to student linkages. Um, but I think it's my mission now to uh, take you back down memory lane on how, why we are celebrating no, this occasion, no, this momentous occasion. Incidentally, this year was also the, the 65th anniversary of the restoration of Japan-Philippine relations. Um, and uh, I think some of my colleagues uh, working on Japanese studies uh, 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 scholarship no, in the Philippines have already um, organized uh, relevant activities not to, to celebrate this. Um, but when I came up with this idea uh, after doing research on uh, what timely occasion can be done at the Asian Center or at the University of the Philippines that relates to the partnership between Japan and the Philippines, I came across two significant articles written by Dean Asaniel. And that brought me to uh, discovery that it has been 101 years since Japanese scholars came to the University of the Philippines to give lectures. And from then on, there have been a lot of meaningful collaborations that have been forged between Filipino and Japanese scholars that ignited not just the interest in the study of Japan, but also to some extent, the study of the Philippines. Okay, so allow me to share with you my, my screen so that uh, we, I can help you uh, recall some of the pivotal events you know, uh, that led to uh, this um, century-old partnership you know, between, um, um, between Japan and the Philippines at least through uh, university to university um, exchanges, okay? Okay, can you see my slides? Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, all right. So um, um, if you're familiar with, uh, with uh, our relationship with Japan, um, historically, the Japanese presence um, 
you know, quite uh, in a more, uh, uh, I guess, um, sparse, no? Uh, different parts of the Philippines, there were quite a number of Japanese already that uh, came to Japan as early as pre-1565. But it was only during the Meiji period in the 1890s when Japanese, in quite significant number, um, began to visit or settle in the Philippines, but not for educational purposes, but mainly for work or business or trade. And uh, the reports that have been documented by Japanese consular uh, offices, even Japanese journalists and academic societies such as Tokyo, Chichigaku, Kyokai um, have been documented. And a lot of these reports um, look into various aspects of the Philippines uh, from the vantage point of Japanese visitors. No? And, and they made a little bit of comparison with that of Japan. Um, and historically, the, the linkages between Japan and the Philippines, if you talk about uh, academic exchanges, um, is uh, originally initiated by the government, no? Japan and Philippine government. So this is why we highlighted Philippines-Japan relations no? um, in our, uh, in our uh, promotion of this event because historically the, 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 the linkages have been diplomatic in nature. Uh, but of course, gradually it evolved, uh, uh, the linkages gradually evolved to uh to incorporate you no know, partnerships that have been initiated by universities themselves and later on by students you no know, that have met you know with one another you no know, Filipino and Japanese students interacting and, and communicating later on. Um, so the study of Japan, the term that was used by Professor Saniel in his two prominent articles on Japanese studies, um, was more of an umbrella category and he she tackled uh, patiently how this is more encompassing um, compared to Japanese and Japan studies because it was uh, um, at that time maybe the study of Japan or Japanese studies wasn't really a structured curriculum no it, not even in UP um, at this at this uh, around this time so in 1920 this was when MEX, the Ministry of Education, supported the uh, fellowship or, or, or uh, visiting scholar um, initiative of, of MEX um, that paved the way for Professor Matsunami Hichiro to come to Japan, uh, to come to the University of the Philippines, specifically at the College of Law, to do a series of lectures for two months. Um, and this was attended by uh, many uh, UP uh, students and faculty. Um, by 1930s and 1940s, it was only in the 1930s that a follow-up to that visiting uh, fellowship by uh, Professor Matsunami was done, no? courtesy of Professor Suginori Kojiro of Waseda University, my, my alma mater, and Professor Yoshitaro uh, uh, of, of Rikyo University, um, they, who both went to UP through an exchange agreement. So around this time, the initiative was already between university, their university and UP. Um, it was also said in uh, Saniel's article that um, there was uh, an educational tour um, that allowed for some Philippine, Filipino students to visit Japan sometime between 1935 to 1940. And uh, uh, one of the uh, outcomes of that was a student council of UP initiated Philippines Japanese uh, Student Conference, no? although there were no, no records on this, unfortunately. And there were also, uh, 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 it was followed up by a series of study tours between 1937 to 1940 by these Filipino students who went to Japan, uh, coinciding Japanese students visiting the Philippines and also UP in particular. Of course, by 1940s, you all know we were occupied by Japan and under the Japan-sponsored Philippine Republic, the military order number two of 1942 ordered the teaching of Nihongo or Japanese language in all schools. And the Bureau of Oriental Culture was established to um, uh, produce textbooks that uh, actually did not become, uh, did not gain fruition, but it was supposed to be taught or used in public and private schools in the Philippines. By late 1945, post-World War, uh, the University of the Philippines reopened. And one of the courses that were relevant to Japan was a course on Far East history that was taught at the history department. Um, in 1956, this was the normalization of Japan-Philippine relations, but a year before that, uh, the Ministry of Education has inaugurated scholarship grants for Filipino undergraduate and graduate students that were interested to uh, pursue uh, further studies in Japan. 
um, 1960s, uh, Philippine Studies and Japan Studies officially became curricular programs offered at the University of the Philippines and Japan Studies in particular was offered uh, as a, as a, initially as an undergraduate course but evolved into a graduate program at the Institute of Asian Studies, of course now known as the Asian Center. Um, uh, I think Dean Saniel was the one sent for doctoral uh, training in Japanese studies and he, she also ventured in several, uh, uh, I think, uh, visiting fellowships and research collaborations um, from then on. Uh, Japanese language courses were first offered at UP at the uh, Department of Oriental Cultures and Linguistics Department, although the first visiting scholar or Japanese language teacher uh, was first affiliated by uh, the Institute of Asian uh, Studies or the Asian Center. Japanese students and researchers and the Japanese uh, overseas cooperation volunteers um, have stimulated interest in Japan among Filipinos in the rural areas because of the several development projects that have been uh, uh, they've been uh, participating in. And I think the Peace Corps volunteers also later on, and then JICA also uh, followed suit, and uh, they were the ones responsible for um, creating this tier three kind of people to people um, connection uh, with Filipinos, particularly in the rural areas through development projects. By 1970s. Uh, Japan Foundation began sending Japanese language teachers to the Philippines, um, uh, but uh, this was uh, like 38 years ago, but um, a few years later, Japan Foundation Manila was born, hence Japan Foundation Manila became the uh, uh, agency responsible for cultivating interest in the study of Japanese uh, history, society, and language. Um, and it's been 25 years since the Japan Foundation Manila um, was founded. Um, so faculty and students at UP Diliman was report, were reported to be uh, becoming more increasingly involved in research on Japan and in Japanese activities in the Philippines, as well as those related to Japan-Philippine relations um, from the 1970s. And more education-related initiatives on the part of the Japanese government were conducted uh, in the form of scholarships, fellowships, and trainings, especially when the Pukuda Doctrine was signed in, the 19, in 1977. So a lot of research collaborations were uh, uh, created uh, involving faculty members of the University of the Philippines and the University of Tokyo and several other Japanese universities um, by virtue of the Agreement of Academic Exchange signed in 1977. Fast forward. According to uh, the University of the Philippines Office for uh, Office of the Vice, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, as of this year, there has been uh, the University of the Philippines has or had memorandum of agreement and understanding with at least seventy-seven universities in Japan. So the list is already there, and as of this year, um, according to my colleagues in a research project, um, Japan ranks second among the top five countries where faculty members at the University of the Philippines obtained their master's and PhD degrees with 75 from UP Diliman um, graduating um, from um, and a total of, uh, yeah, with 75 of them. Uh, this is not very exhaustive, but at least you get, a, you get the figure of how much, uh, um, I think, linkages, no, academic linkages have been created uh, that have resulted in uh, you know, higher degrees of, or, or uh, MA, doctoral degrees obtained by faculty at the University of the Philippines. Um, and Japan has been responsible for this. Japanese universities have been responsible for, uh, for facilitating this. Um, so how much have been achieved by Japanese scholars in terms of research, in terms of partnerships? Um, I think at this point, I'm giving way uh, to our uh, uh, our guest lecturer to provide a more micro context not to the experiences of Japanese scholars doing research in the Philippines and forging uh, partnerships no, with UP scholars and, and, and students. Um, so I'd like I'd like to at this point introduce our uh, our uh, main speaker for this afternoon, and that is none other than Professor Toro Nakanishi. Professor Nakanishi is a professor at the Graduate School. Oops. 
Okay. At the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Tokyo, he also teaches at several other universities in Japan. He obtained his doctoral degree in economics in 1989. His dissertation entitled Urban Informal Sector in the Philippines was completed through the support of several UP professors. Dr. Nakanishi has had research collaborations with several notable UP scholars, no? notably Dr. Jose Medina uh, from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, and the late Dr. Silvano Mahiwo of the UP Asian Center. In 1992, he was awarded the Kagami Memorial Prize by the Kagami Memorial Foundation, an award, a prestigious award for the promotion of studies on developing countries. Dr. Nakanishi has published extensively on development economics, agriculture, Philippine economy, and urban development. His recent publications include an edited volume on global society and organic agriculture, open, uh, published by the Open University Press. Um, and another one which came out in 2020 is an article titled Organic Agriculture Against Prosperity of Vice, Food and Health in the Philippines, published uh, by this journal called Oriental Culture um, at the Institute for Advanced Studies on Asia, University of Tokyo. Um, ladies and gentlemen, our dear distinguished guests, um, faculty members, um, students, please help me in welcoming Professor Toru Nakanishi. Thank you very much. And uh, magandang tanghali po sa yung lahat. Um, thank you very much for kind of introduction for me. So, Professor um, Serero. And um, I'm Toru Nakanishi, Professor Minimaku Tokyo today. Mabuhay, I stand down there some nothing. And it's my great honor to share your valuable opening remarks, Professor Sevilla. And uh, I'd like to express my great appreciation to Professor Sereno again for giving me to share this historical opportunity. And uh, um, Professor Dr. Piquero Valescas and Professor Dr. Ioneno, I'd like to appreciate your kindly accepting lecture to me. Then Professor Nurasco, thank you very much for your kind assistance. And I'd like to uh, also appreciate Asian Center and uh, uh, Japan Foundation, especially for the director Suzuki-san for preparation for this lecture. Now I'd like to share my uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Can you see this? Okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay. And we can hear you as well. Okay. And, uh, and it is my great honor to be invited to this uh, memorial, uh, memorable anniversary as uh, one of the witnesses to 101 years history of the University of Philippines and uh, Japanese university, including the University of Tokyo, and to share this historical milestone with you. Actually, I am a professor at Todai, and uh, I have uh, conducted many research on the Philippines since 1985. I have never had but, uh, the opportunity, however, of a formal study at UP. So frankly speaking, it is uh, true that I was hesitant to accept such an important role of making speech here. But on the other hand, I know I have received an inexpressible depth of gratitude from the University of Philippines over the past 40 years. As the, a senior faculty member of Todai, I'd like to grat gratefully accept this opportunity to reflect on my 40 years of involvement with UP and the Philippines and to play a role as a bridge to pass our relationships at great historical assets created by um, predecessors on the next generation. And now <clears throat> my first encounter with the Philippines was a high school student 
in the late 1970s, when I read the Japanese translation of Without Seeing the Dawn, written by Stefan Habariana, he's a UP law graduate. I still remember very well the shock I felt when I learned that peaceful rural villages described in the first part day was completely destroyed by Japanese army in the second part night. And when I knew some copy of this book in UP Dilliman Library had been read by many students and was heavily physically damaged, according to the translator, I became eager to visit the Philippines. In Japan at that time, there was growing criticism against Japanese behavior in the Philippines, such as the sport of pollution or a Japanese sex tourism. And that during my high school age, I was indulged in the student activism rather than studies. And perhaps I felt indignation so specific to the young people that my country had invaded the Philippines in Second World War and uh, was still causing a great deal of troubles to the Philippines even after the war. Thus, I had a vague idea that I wanted to study the current socioeconomic situation in the Philippines and to contribute to making better the relationships between Philippines and Japan. And finally, in 1980, I visited the Philippines during my undergraduate. As a member of study tour, they say um, exposure program guided by Spanish priest. During the tour, we visited several universities, such as Ateneo de Manila, Ateneo de Zabao, or Sevilla, aside from UP. And they were greatly uh, impressed by the lecture served by Professor Landy Davy, TWSC at that time. Uh, and uh, at that time, the Philippines was under the martial law of the Marcos regime. But in Professor David's office, there was a picture of Karl Marx, not of President Marcos. And uh, in the front of the picture of Karl Marx, Professor David eloquently criticized Japanese multinational corporation and saying that Japan was the second, second biggest enemy next to the USA. We Japanese students were overwhelmed by his powerful lecture. And uh, in this tour, we are experienced homestay in Tondo, Manila, and uh, Malay Balai in Bugidna and uh, so on. And uh, we encounter serious uh, socioeconomic issue in the Philippines, or poverty or uh, dictatorship connected with dependency on US and Japan, etc. And thus the tour in 1980 had a decisive impact on me. In 1982, I entered the Graduate School of Economics, Todai, because Professor Akira Takahashi taught the Philippine economy there. I was eager to study with him. And uh, Professor Takahashi had studied peasant economies and their wisdom in rural life and farm management and the tenancy, so-called Kasamahan system, in Bulacan for a long time. After the war, in 1958, 1958 is my birth year, but Professor Takahashi was the first Japanese student to study at UP under the Philippine government scholarship program. In the Philippines, where the deep damage of the world still remain at that time, he established his own style of learning from farmers living in Nipa Hut near the research field and conducted the research based on participant observations and the interview to the Magsasaka and the peasant as shown in the photo. And he used to talk 
to us. Um, many peasants said to him, and Unan Beses Nami, Makakita, Nan Hapon, Nan Hindi Sundaro. Unfortunately, Professor Takashi passed away in year 2008, but my interest was in urban poverty, and most of the urban poor were from rural area. So I believe that to understand rural economy was also essential for me. I had planned a research project with Professor Takahashi, and after a preliminary survey in 1983, I visited the Philippines again in 1985 to conduct full-scale survey research on the urban informal sector for my doctoral dissertation. And uh, I still remember when I visited the uh, Professor Alonso office, UPSE, School of Economics, without any appointment in July 1985. At that time, we have no email. So he, but he kindly gave me a copy of his uh, my mimeograph on urban informal sector and explained me its current situation. His article in 1980, I had read beforehand, was on, was on informal transportation. But he also introduced me to several materials on waste pickers and junk shop for my topic. And Professor Adon's interests were rather than rather more macroscope but he gave me deep insight into the status and meanings of informal sector in macroeconomy in the Philippines. His rich advice was very deep and helpful. So I could finish my doctoral dissertation in 1989, and it was published in 1991. Now, uh, please let me talk about my research field in Concepcion Malabon. I have visited the locality this 35 years, since 1985. The people had called this locality, they called a Tambakan before I visited, because this site had been built on dump site, open dump site. My host family is from Panay Island, the setting of without seeing the dawn. And uh, many of their relatives were suspected to be guerrillas and uh, were shot dead by Japanese soldiers, just right in that story. But they have kindly accepted me as a family member. And until now, in spite of uh, uh, such a kind, uh, such a uh, sad history. In 1985, we could easily find malnourished children working as child laborers there, like uh, the pictures. And uh, but now, several decades later, this locality has developed a lot through the effect of the people. Nowadays, nobody calls it Tambakan anymore. I believe that one of the reason of this development is the growing closeness of social relationships or social networks among the people. For example, this figure shows the relationship among kinship groups. Here, kinship groups share the same family name. And the black line indicates the kinship relations that already exist before their arrival there. <clears throat> and the red line indicates endogamy, which shows marriage between people who encounter in this locality. So after their arrival, as looking at the dynamic of network since 1970s, we, have, we can find a network have been getting deeply connected, like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
So we can find that almost 19% of kinship groups have been connected to one until, 90, 90, until so year 2005. And uh, next, the figure showed that the digital kinship relation were compadrasm, the so-called uh, ninon, ninan, inanak relation, dynamics of uh, network is as follows. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just, uh, I just, yes, okay. Um, the ne dynamics of a network is as follows. Wait. In 1985, 90, 95, 2000, and 2005, we can see that this relationship also have been united into one big network until year 2005. Finally, in year 2005, when we put these two figures together, we can see that all are connected. All are connected by kinship and uh, such uh, compadrasal relationship. Such, kin uh, such cross knit relationships led to the birth of the first Kagawat in the locality in year 2008. This is Tina, my host family member since 1985. And she visited Japan in year 2008 and gave us a lecture in Torai on her experiences and activities. Now back to my uh, relationship with UP. During my graduate school days, I became a tutor for several Filipino students. And I got to know two wonderful uh, researchers. One is Professor Dr. President Makito, who is currently working at the UPLB on economics for including inclusion of vulnerable, vulnerable from perspective of shared growth. I joined his dissertation committee and I learned a lot from him about uh, Japan's ODA to the Philippines. And he taught at the uh, Temple University in Japan for a long time. And uh, since our interests are very close, we have had many collaborations. He's very fluent in Japanese. I think he is uh, the economist who speaks Japanese the most fluently, fluently in the Philippines and uh, deeply understand Japanese culture. We are still collaborate, collaborating on organ farming and so-called community currency. And uh, <clears throat> the other one is a professor, Dr. Ricardo Jose. He is a professor of history, UPD. And Dr. Jose, and I have different specializations. So we have not had opportunity to collaborate our studies. But he has always supported us in the Department of History and the TWSC. Before two years ago, so he was director of TWSC. And uh, when I visited his office with my student. As he's the authority of historian, and historical, especially historical relation between Philippines and Japan. I have learned a lot about, so called, for example, Makapiri story or many other important historical facts during the Second World War that he has discovered. From year, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> from year 1999 to 2001, I had been involved in a big project on environmental issues in Metro Manila. This was a joint project between UP and Japanese universities, uh, including Tokyo Institute of Technology and Torai. And I was greatly, uh, greatly uh, in, depth, in depth to Professor Alonso again in this project. In particular, he gave me a verbal comment when we published the final product from UP Press. At that time, he was Deputy Director General of NEDA too. 
And he pointed out many problems in poverty statistics in Philippines. And as an economist, he understood my position, my economic anthropological scope, which encouraged, which encouraged me so, so much. It's very sorry, but however, that uh, he passed away in year 2016. And in this project, I also have wonderful encounter with Professor Dr. Mahio of Asian Center. We shared the joint project with the engineering scholars to invent a toilet which converted human waste into organic fertilizer during year 1999 to 2001. And uh, with this encounter, a starting point, we began to prepare new joint project. New, new joint project. Um, and on community and organic agriculture around the year 2012, I suppose. And I want, we wanted to integrate our different researches. That is his study on rice terraces in Ifugao, his hometown, and my research on socioeconomic networks in Malabon. I just show you and into a study on environmental conservation from a new perspective on organic farming with community networks. But sadly and unfortunately, this plan was abandoned because Professor Mahio passed away six years ago. I really wish he would be here but because Professor Mahio already, um, uh, you know, would have been a very suitable speaker here. Needless to say, because of his great contribution to building affiliation between UP and Todai and other universities in Japan, as well as to Japan Foundation as fellow there. Thus, since year 2010, I have been also deeply interested in organic agriculture. So on this topic, I have been taught many things from Professor Dr. Medina. He is well known as one of the founders of famous NGOs in the Philippines, Masipag. Magsasaka at Tien Tepiko, Parasa Pang, as well as UPLB professor. And he taught me a basis of um, organic agriculture in the Philippines and also gave me the opportunity to present a paper at a big conference in UPLB. I deeply um, respect Professor Medina in the fact that uh, he is not only an excellent scholar, but also a great practitioner of organic farming, always being with peasant. He has promoted organic farming movement in his home province, Negros Occidental, with consideration on inclusive development for the indigenous people and also contribute to the declaration of organic island in Negros in year 2011. And he taught me my, he taught me and my student at the time we visited the Philippines. Thus I have received a lot of so-called Utana Rob from UP. And it is Utana Rob, so I cannot return it very well. But at least I'd like to return to it as possible as I can. Though there are only a few things I can do. One is to promote contact and communications between students of UP and Todai. And we have not so many Filipino students in Todai, unfortunately, because of Japanese language requirement 
in many cases. But I had taught several Filipino undergraduates from UP. And uh, I have also become a supervisor for two excellent Filipino graduate students from the Asian centers. Both of them are now working in Japan. And uh, on the other hand, since 1993, when I began to teach in Todai, at that first time in Faculty of Economics, I have organized a study tour to the Philippines every year, except last two years because of pandemic. But in this tour, usually 10 to 20 students of Todai have participated every year. And uh, I always gave students of Todai a chance of meeting with UP students and of home stay in my research field for three days. One student, one house. So many students have decided to study in UP after these tours. And by the way, um, in my research field in Malabon, we can see the great activities of the younger generation in recent years. One of them is Professor Dr. Kelby Arbales, UPD History. He won the award of Young Historian Prize in year 2015. I know him from his birth or before his birth, because he was born in my research field, the locality in Malabo. And his family had confronted a hardship at that time, but his family had always encouraged him for his excellent talent. And he became the first person of, of cut in the locality in year 2006. And he became the first person, yes, of cut at, he graduated from UP at Magna Cum Laude from UP history. And he began to teach undergraduate at the same time as entering the UP graduate school. And his experience has given a lot of hope to the people in the, our locality and has also totally changed the outsider's gaze to the locality. He was also passionate about encourage, encouraging younger generation. In the photo on the right below, he was giving weekend tutorial class to the next generation of talented high school students there when he was undergraduate UP student. And, have, and uh, five of these students passed off cut in year 2010. After taking MA UPD, he got PhD from Namur University in Belgium. Now he is assistant professor of UPD history. He do research focus on the history of impact of a natural disaster on politics, society, and people's behavior. Our faculty is going to invite him to Todai as a building associate professor next year. Now I have a plan to write history of Santo Nino supported by him. Now, I would like to mention about one of five of that persons in year 2010. She is Dr. Manning Hamola. She also um, always confronted hardship from her childhood due to her poor, uh, because of uh, the poor health of her parents. She grew up in a small one room house for five member family. And she had to support her family by picking waste in elementary school days in dumping site. With the support of overseas NGOs, she graduated from public high school regular class with excellent grade. And with the help of Kelby and others, she passed off cut. And after graduate from biology UPLB, she studied at Drasa Medical School with overseas scholarships. And after passing licensure exam, she is now fighting COVID-19 on the front line at, at the hospital in Tondo. And after the pandemic is over, 
will have a joint research plan on food and obesity among the poor. When I started my research, most of people in my locality were under the poverty line, but now they are just escaping from poverty by building and developing their community and by close, by close knit their social networks. I'm very happy to see the people who will become leaders contribute to true development of the nation in the future are coming out of locality through UP. As mentioned at the beginning, my first encounter with Philippines was with Stefan Haberianas with us in the dawn. And I believe that Philippines is now moving to a brighter new day that was never described, not described in this book. Indeed, that is so wonderful. And uh, as a scholar, I have been able to meet UP scholars, students, and graduates, and many people, and learn a lot from sharing their experiences based on relationship with them. I have been, I have seen how much I have been taught and supported by such wonderful people. So, but Isan Dang at Isan Town. And for me, I have been very fortunate, fortunate compared to those in of previous generations because I'm not graduation that have never known war. I know many of participants here have never experienced war like me. And for thinking about the long-term relationship between our two countries. However, we Japanese should not forget what happened, what had happened during Second World War. Needless to say, in Second World War, Japan occupied the Philippines by force and many Filipinos lives were lost. The history of my host family in Malabon, in the localities, was very story of with us since the dawn. It is a history of many Filipinos too. So I'd like to say one more thing to conclude my speech. Indeed, our development is always on continuing past, even across the generation. I believe it is important not to forget the lives, the history of the people, and Kasai Sayan Namangatao in order to understand how important peace is for academic development. I'm confident that the next generation continues to pursue to keep peaceful days, peaceful day between two countries. So Mabuhai Isandang at Isan Town, Parasan Nat Natin Ure. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Mami, mami, salamat. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nakanishi, for that very well-rounded, I think, presentation. It's like uh, the, the discussion in the presentation on the historical development of, of uh, the partnership no, between the University of the Philippines and your university, the University of Tokyo. I think uh, it has come full circle through your presentation. And it's like following you know, a, a, in long duration um, also the development of the lives of, of the people who were uh, in, 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 in Concepcion, no? Malabon, uh, that became uh, your field site over the last four decades. And it's just fascinating to see how much, you know, you have, how much development and improvement in the lives of the people, particularly socioeconomically and professionally speaking, uh, the, the, the improvement of the life trajectory of the younger generations of the people of Concepcion, I think it's a testament to how much development level of development has been achieved in the urban context no um, but also more fascinatingly like through all these endeavors research endeavors you have done um, 
uh, we have also built an extensive network of, of collaborators, no, uh, uh, researchers uh, from the University of the Philippines and, and the University of, of Tokyo. Thank you very much for that. And I think at this point, I'd like to give the floor to our two distinguished uh, scholars who, are, who will serve as reactors no, to the presentation of Professor Nakanishi. And while that's happening, I'd like to invite our audience also to fill in your questions and comments on the chat box. Um, and we will address that um, at the open forum when our two reactors have done their, um, their, their, um, their sharings, okay? So uh, first, I'd like to introduce our first reactor. Um, our first reactor is uh, not new at all to the Asian Center. Uh, Dr. Vicio Yoneno Reyes has been working in the field of area studies, particularly in Philippine studies and Japan studies with a disciplinary background in ethnomusicology and anthropology. Her current research projects include international migration of Asian care workers, music activities of Asian migrants in Japan, folk songs of indigenous Filipinos in Asian modernity, and database production of the films and photographs by a Japanese merchant in the early 20th century Philippines. She has co-edited uh, a volume called Foreign Nurses Working in Japan, Assessments of the EPA Program um, in 2021, I believe that's forthcoming, edited Popular Culture of East Asia, Philippine Perspectives that uh, came out in 2013 um, on the Asian uh, Center, published uh, with the Asian Center, and is currently preparing a manuscript titled Doing and Undoing Tradition in Philippine Salidumai, Singing of Modernities in a Post-Colonial Periphery. Before securing her current post as, as professor at the University of Shizuoka, she had taught at the University of the Philippines Asian Center from 1999 to 2016, as introduced by uh, Dean uh, Sibilia at, at, the, uh, at the beginning. And uh, at the University of Tokyo from 2017 to 2021. At the University of Shizuoka, she is the coordinator of the university's exchange program with the University of the Philippines. So she's really very befitting to be our reactor for today's um, lecture. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Michio Yuneno Reyes. Thank you very much, Professor Celero, uh, for the wonderful introduction. Okay, it is my great pleasure to be back to the UT Asian Center, my home in the past two decades for the very occasion to commemorate 101 years of the exchange between UT and Japanese universities. I'd like to thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity, particularly the Japan Foundation Manila, led by Director Ben Suzuki and Deputy Director Wataru Abe, and the UT Asian Center, led by Dean Henelita Siberia Jr. with the strong initiative of Professor Joseli Celero. By the way, congratulations to Dean Siberia for your new post. I understand that the faculty members and the staff have been involved in preparations of this event and even perhaps post-production uh, management. Thank you very much. I'm also pleased to meet with Professor Toru Nakanishi and Professor Cherry Piquero Valiescas after some years. After I met Professor Nakanishi during the doctorate dissertation defense of Ms. Erika Shioson at the University of Tokyo in 2018, Erika was my former advisee for her master's thesis at the Asian Center. She wrote a wonderful dissertation on the Filipino community in Nagoya, which I myself uh, cite uh, in my articles. Today, we have just heard Professor Tom Takanishi's wonderful life history interwoven with his research experiences and academic exchanges between the two countries. It is touching that an elite Japanese economist has been working in the areas areas which are economically underprivileged in the Philippines, gathering the data literally from the grassroots, uh, while at the same time contributing to the improvement of socio-economic status of the people of the areas where he conducted fieldwork. 
also I would imagine how invaluable the experiences his students had in the Philippines could have been and will be to them. We have just learned that it was his friendship with distinguished scholars from UP uh, that enriched uh, his uh, research and other academic activities throughout his career. To correspond to his life history, please allow me to also narrate my story, my connection with Japanese universities when I was affiliated with the European Asian Center as well as my connection with the UP after moving to Japan. Particularly, I'd like to mention the Asian student survey led by Professor Shigeto Sonoda of the University of Tokyo, KUASU project led by Professor Eniko Ochiai of Kyoto University, and the exchange program of the University of Chizuoka and the UP. First, Asian student survey. I met with Professor Shigeto Sonoda uh, of the University of Tokyo at the brand new Toyota building in the early, very early 2090s. Professor Sonoda, a China expert, was hosted by the late Professor Eileen Badiera and rendered a lecture on the China-Japan relation. By the way, he was with Professor Akio Takahara of the University of Tokyo too. Eventually, Professor Sonada accepted several Filipino students of mine in the newly established graduate program in Asian Studies uh, at the University of Tokyo, uh, conducted in English. In 2013, Professor Sonoda conducted the second wave of Asian student survey following the first one in 2008. It is a comprehensive survey among the students of leading universities in Asia conducted every five years. The UP was one of the two universities selected for the survey from the Philippines. Eventually, I became the contact person for the survey for the Philippines. I was also, I was also able to host his student from Tokyo who went around the Diliman campus to distribute and collect the questionnaire. We also went to De La Salle University. Professor some of the students in Tokyo encoded the data and the, the professor so that they generously shared the data with my students at the UPAC Asian Center. So in one seminar course, my students were able to analyze the data. It was thrilling to remember that we connected the classrooms in Manila and Tokyo at that time when there was no Zoom yet through the video conference system and conducted an internationally collaborated uh, uh, graduate seminar course. Uh, I think this was uh, in, two, in 2014, 2015. We also hosted an international symposium at the Asian Center in 2016. So such a collaboration and exchange gave birth to a community of young promising scholars. An Asian Center graduate, Mr. Alison Giliota, is now a PhD candidate uh, and a research assistant of Professor Sonoda at the University of Tokyo. I'm also in touch with one of the Professor Sonoda's former students who is now a PhD candidate in the, in the United States uh, doing migration studies. Actually, I sent the links of uh, the photographs and the articles of these activities uh, to the host, if uh, possible, kindly share. Uh, or perhaps you can just simply uh, type the Asian Student Survey UP or something like that. Okay, second, KUASU uh, project. Kyoto University has hosted the KUASU project or Kyoto University Asian Studies Unit since 2012, led by a leading sociologist and feminist scholar, Professor Eniko Ochiai. Professor Caroline Sobricha was the first contact of this project. Eventually, I was also dragged into this project and attended its annual conferences several times in the 2010s. The UP Asian Center was able to send several graduate students and faculty members to Kyoto University for short-term research visit or for paper presentations. 
Oh, by the way, I also would like to acknowledge that some of their trips were partially supported by the Japan Foundation. The course team also visited the Asian Center a few times. I recall we held an international symposium on migration issues, again with the support of the Japan Foundation. We have accepted their graduate students in my seminar classes, and the students of the two universities enjoyed discussions on Japan on the topics uh, on, on Japan studies and Philippine studies. From this connection, uh, Dr. Katrina Navagio eventually took her PhD studies at the Kyoto University. So these are the examples that grassroots exchange activities are a very important to nurture future distinguished scholars. And I'm very much uh, uh, proud of being part, having been part of these activities. The third, University of Shizuoka. Since last April this year, I have been teaching at the University of Shizuoka, located at one of the best places in the country, overlooking Mount Fuji. One of my primary responsibilities is to enhance the academic relation between the University of Shizuoka and the University of the Philippines. The relation of the two universities began in July 1989, uh, which is quite early for the very young university, of, 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 which was just, oh, which had been just server. established in 1987. When Dean Leslie uh, Bowson of College of Arts and Letters uh, visited the University of Chisoka and rendered a lecture, that eventually uh, developed into the conclusion of MOA in April 1996. I recall that in the latter half of the 1990s, when I was a graduate student of UP College of Music and residing at the International Center, there were several undergraduate and graduate students at UP from the University of Shizuoka every year. I'm still in touch with some of them. Now I understand that they were the product of such a connection. From our record, in the past 10 years, we had sent 20 students from Shizuoka and accepted five students from UP. Also, we have accommodated six faculty members for short visits in the last five years before the pandemic. Moreover, some of our faculty members and students have visited the Philippines every year for study tours. Starting this year, both universities are hosting up to four students each year, each other. So I'm committed to host the further development of this exchange program. The University of Shizuoka will definitely welcome students, faculty members at the University of Shizuoka at the heart of Mount Fuji and along the historical Tokaido Road. Shizuoka Prefecture also houses uh, hosts some of the biggest Filipino communities in Japan. We'll have a lot to do while in Shizuoka. Conclusion. Professor Nakanish's talk began and ended with a story about the memory of the war. I believe the war history is a topic that we Japanese scholars who are working on the Philippines uh, must not forget to face. When I was informed about the very first lecture by a Japanese professor rendered at the University of the Philippines in 1920. I was able to connect the period with my current research project that looks at the rare films and photographs taken by Japanese merchants based in the Philippines in the 1920s and 1930s. Professor Ricardo Jose of the UP Department of History is playing a significant role in this project. And again, I thank this academic connection that UP offers. In this connection, I'd like to mention Mr. Shonosuke Furuya. He arrived in the Philippines in 1915 and worked as a cameraman at Sun Studios uh, in Manila while studying at the UP School of Fine Arts before he moved to Baguio in the mid 1920s. It is possible that he was the first Japanese student who studied at UP either in the late 1910s or the early 1920s. 
Mr. Furuya could have been a student when Professor Haichiro Matsunami rendered a lecture at UP 101 years ago. It is exciting to such a micro historical academic event that connects the two countries. My memory, by the way, flashes that one of the major projects that I supervised at the UPAC was to host a photograph exhibition and an international symposium of Japanese migrants in Tokyo, where photographs taken by Mr. Shonosuke Furuya were important materials. Once again, this event was uh, also generous, generously, generously supported by the Japan Foundation. Uh, Director Suzuki was still, or uh, was uh, the director then. I'd like to take this opportunity to express my deep gratitude to the Japanese uh, Japan Foundation once again. The Japanese, the, the academic challenge we face today that to, is to clarify what these Japanese migrants in the Philippines in the 1920s and 30s actually did. We are challenged by the common notion in the Philippines that they were spies. But our grassroots research materials suggest more diverse aspects of their activities. In the first place, it is impossible that there were 20 or 30,000 spies. Okay, the spies can be as so a spy can be a spy when they are just only one or two or three among many. Certainly, some of them were close to some Americans as personal friends. For instance, in the very first place, the merchant was able to take a number of films and photographs because the family had a business next to the office of Kodak in Manila. So I hope to contribute to further deepening the historical and the current connection of the two countries through research and education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yoneno Reyes. Um, it feels like a graduate student again at the Asian Center hearing you talk. Um, and uh, yeah, it's too bad that you never became a professor, but it's, it's always a pleasure to always hear you um, do a lecture. Okay, um, from uh, Professor Yoneno Reyes, let's move on to our second reactor. And I wouldn't want to miss uh, this opportunity to also um, invite another distinguished scholar who has also influenced me to do migration studies and um, you know, do research on Japan. And uh, our second reactor is none other than Professor Maria Rosario Piquero Baliescas. We fondly call uh, her Mom Cherry. Um, professor Baliescas is a retired professor of the Regional Development Studies of Toyo University in Tokyo, Japan from 2009 to 2017 and the Social Sciences Division of the University of the Philippines, Cebu. She was a visiting faculty and researcher at the Department of Sociology of the University of Tsukuba from 1988 to 1992, where she obtained her PhD in sociology as the first Asian, first female and first graduate of that department. She also taught from 1974 to 1988 at the Department of Sociology, University of the Philippines, Diliman, where she completed her undergraduate degree in sociology and uh, obtained a cum laude um, distinction. At present, she continues to be active as columnist for the Freeman Cebu as coordinator and president of the Regional Center for Expert of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development and president of Phila James Cebu. Um, she's also a volunteer at the Apostleship of the Sea in Cebu and author of several books and articles about gender, child labor, agrarian reform, migration, and other development-related topics. Her recent publication includes a chapter titled Views About Women Empowerment and in Its Obstacles, Women Leaders from Various Communities in, in Evidence-Based Knowledge to Achieve SDGs from Field Activities, published by the Center for Sustainable Development Studies at University uh, at Toyo University in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our second reactor is Professor Maria Rosario Piquero Baliescas. Moncheri. Hello, can you hear me please? Yes, ma'am, loud and clear. Because it's raining in Cebu. <laughs> Actually, okay. the typhoon is here. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Konnichiwa, magandang hapon, maayong hapon inyong tanan. Uh, first, I would like to thank Asian Center and Japan Foundation uh, for today's special lecture on Philippine-Japan relations. A very personal thank you as well to our young scholar, Dr. Jocelyn Silero, for inviting me to today's event. I would like also to say hello, extend my warm greetings to our co-panelists, Professor Michio Yoneno Reyes, and most especially, uh, thank you to Professor Toru Nakanishi for your valuable themes for reflection, which I would like to react and talk about today. I also want to say thank you to Dean Sevilla, whom I met uh, today. And he's a Visayan as well. My hapon, sir. Okay. Uh, can we show the slide, please? So um, I prepared a little slide uh, presentation for you. And this is also to thank uh, Professor Toru Nakanishi for his uh, sharing about his journey to the Philippines, to the University of the Philippines, and back to Japan. I will do the opposite. I will now present my reactions as a scholar in Japan from the University of the Philippines and then back. Uh, UP, Japan, U Philippines, Japan, and so forth. That has been our life uh, since the first time we entered the academy in 1976. Yes, please. The second slide, please. Okay. Uh, Professor Toru Nakanishi presented uh, I will lift five themes from his uh, discussion, which I find very valuable for reflection. One is we are all connected. Number two is isang daan at isang taong kasaysayan. Okay. And uh, the third is our development, oops, not yet, please. Our development is always on the continuing past. Our past continues even across generations. And number four, it's important not to forget to relieve the history of the people, ang kaisaysaya ng mga tao, in order to understand how important peace is for academic development. So the goal is not just academic development, the goal is higher. It's peace in the case of Professor Nakanishi. Number five, relationships among universities in the Philippines and Japan can play a great role and uh, this is especially, they can play great roles for the promotion of peace, uh, for the continuation of cross-cultural relations. Okay, so can we go to the next, please? Uh, the biographical review of Professor Toru Nakanishi about his connections, relationships with Filipinos, with the University of the Philippines, with the rest of Philippine society is an, uh, really nostalgic. Uh, encouraging us to review our own journey bridging the Philippines and Japan. His biographical review also reminds us that a biographical review, a review of your personal journey, his as well as ours, is at the same time a historical and societal review. And the Philippine relations across time, across history, and across and within societal and global context accompanied his biographical review. Uh, his review also recalls the value of a sociologist, an American sociologist, C. Wright Mills, and in his book entitled Sociological Imagination, published in 1959, but still uh, his idea showing the close connections and relationships among a person's story as society's history and society meaning local and global society all these relationships are linked uh, so very briefly i'll just show you the next slide please this is cw wright mills and that's the link biography society history and no social study that does not come back to the problem of biography of history and of their interactions within a society i'm sorry can you Thank you, has completed its intellectual journey. So the, the interplay of the three is very important, in which Professor Nakanishi, an economist, also tried to share. Yes, please, the next one. If you will allow me, uh, please join me, revisit my past. 
uh, then come with me to examine how the past continues to the present and how the past and the present extend to tomorrow to our collective future. So revisiting the past, uh, my trip from the Philippines to Japan. There are four highlights of my academic journey to Japan. Uh, one starts with my education uh, in Japan. I'm sorry, this is very small, but if you will bear with me, uh, what it says here is, I, in 1976, I went to Osaka on the Mombusha Ministry of Education Scholarship. And I enrolled for a Japanese language course for six months. We are required actually to take that. And uh, this was in Osaka, uh, no, the, what is it? Osaka Gai, Gaikoku Daingaku. Yes, all right. And then from there in 1976, I went to Tsukuba because my research topic was an agrarian reform in Japan. And uh, Tsukuba is in Ibaraki, Ken. So from Osaka, a big city, I was uh, sent to a small, at that time, it was just developing into a city, but uh, it was more uh, generally rural still at that time. So I went there and my professor was Komai Sensei. I was there for a research uh, degree, but uh, just at that time I was there, they had opened for the first time the MA PhD in sociology program. And so I enrolled for that and got my PhD in 1983. Okay, so that's my educational background. Please note that as a Komai Sensei and some places, some universities will be very prominent in my uh, subse subsequent joinings to Japan. Yes, please. Next is my uh, the continuing task. So from being educated, from studying, I now become the teacher. Yes, please. So it continues. Uh, contrary, to, I think, to most uh, uh, the common perception, I did not teach in Tsukuba right away. I was invited as a lecturer at uh, Tsuda Juku Dainaku. This is an exclusive girls' school and invited by an American um, social scientist by the name of Professor Douglas Loomis. I think we met in an advocacy uh, campaign about against uh, the Japanese, what is it? Uh, entry into uh, Philippine agriculture, and then uh, they, they were taking bananas and uh, forest uh, products uh, being sent to Japan. Okay, next after that, I was invited uh, back to Tsukuba as a, a visiting foreign professor short term, and then again uh, several times for that. And then I went and was invited by Professor Gus Yokoyama to another uh, private girls' school. This was um, in uh, Yokohama, Ferris University. And um, for this whole time, I was on very short, very brief lectureship or visiting professor, professor uh, stint. But in 2009 to 2017, I was asked by Toyo University uh, to be a uh, tenured professor at the Regional Development uh, Studies in Tokyo. So please note that from Tokyo, I went to Ibaraki, Kent, Cuba, and then I went back to Tokyo, uh, to Yokohama, and then to Tokyo. The reason why Gas Sensei and An Sensei um, knew me and met me was, uh, I think Professor Toru um, mentioned it. They have a system in Japan where they send uh, their students and their faculty for uh, no, field work elsewhere in a country of their choice and of a topic. And I met a uh, professor, uh, Yokoyama, then when he was, when he came here to Siliman and uh, to with his students. And then Professor An also when he brought his Toyo students for a summer workshop, which I arranged at the time I was already with the Uni University of the Philippines in Cebu. Okay, so from, uh, from studying, I met the same people that connected to uh, new people when I started to teach. But at the same time, in between, I was teaching at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and I transferred to the University of the Philippines, Cebu, in 1992. Okay, so from there on, um, I will now go to research. 
can I have the next slide, please? Okay. So I have informed you about my journey to Japan in terms of my education background uh, and my teaching background. And the theme now for this portion of research and advocacy will be the past continuing to the present and to the future. So uh, very briefly, I would just like to say that up to 1989, I was uh, researching and publishing about agrarian reform in the Philippines. And I have not published any report yet about the, the very topic I went to Japan for. Uh, this was uh, agrarian reform in Japan. You probably will want to know why I decided to go to Japan to study agrarian reform. You see, I went in 1976, we were under martial law, and uh, there were several models of successful agrarian reform then. One was Japan, one was China, PRC, People's Republic of China, and one was uh, Taiwan. Taiwan was under uh, dictatorships. So I did not want to go there. I know China also, we did not have um, diplomatic relations then in 1976. So I was left with Japan and I was not, uh, I, I, I was fascinated with Japan since high school because of the beautiful cherry blossoms that we saw uh, and read about in our literature class. Also, we had our literature teacher who became, who went to Japan to start to become a religious nun. And so Japan had always been there. But my mother and my father met during the Japanese war in Bohol. And uh, my husband and I, I met in Japan. So uh, they would say, Un nga aru. They, they would say in Japanese, that's probably destiny, coincidence. Anyway, so uh, then we went for advocacies, okay? Um, from research, my stay in Japan had always been one of advocacies. Uh, my main research had always been on Filipino entertainers, Filipino migrants in Japan until 2021. Okay, so the advocacy is related to migrants in distress. Okay, I'll rush through, please. Uh, can you do the next, please? Next slide, please. Okay, so continuing from the past uh, to the present, to the future, there were several C's themes that uh, I, Nakanishi Sense and I share. One is choice. Uh, being in a university and traveling from, uh, joining from one country to, to the other starts with choice, the agency. Uh, you choose where you want to go, but at the same time, it is within context. Uh, I explained to you why I had to go to Japan. It was in the context of martial law, and then uh, Japan had offered scholarships. Japan then in the 70s was the land of the rising yen, okay? So had much to offer. And then the connections matter in life. They will stay with you, not the bad kone, not the special kone that uh, people talk about, the special uh, privileged connections, but no, connections that are meaningful for your career, meaningful for your, they become family for you uh, forever and friends forever. Then the convergence of connection, context, choice, convergence of your story, societal story, and history, they all combine together. And then, of course, the fifth was crusade. Uh, Professor Nakanishi and I share that uh, studying the relationship uh, beyond, beyond the goal of studying for our academic course are really higher themes of wanting to improve the world. So uh, it's within the context of local, cross-cultural, and then global uh, relationships. Are we now at peace? Do we have equality throughout the world? Is there justice? And universities and networks help to go towards the direction of advocacy for peace, equality, and justice. And so at the end, uh, life is for a mission. And the mission is to have a better present for more people, a better future for the people and planet, and uh, for societies and for the whole world. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much. These are my global students uh, from Africa, Asia, uh, Japan, and so on. Uh, Japan is now in a global, uh, in the age of global education. And that's why uh, from a very exclusive, what is it? Japan in 70s was 
going towards internationalization. And then in the 1990s, Japan was aiming for multiculturalism. And then now uh, Japan is now uh, really promoting global education and global solidarity. And uh, they like, uh, like the rest of the world, like the rest of the United Nations, aiming for sustainable development goals so that we have a better planet and better people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Valiescas. It's uh, it's the uh, you you you're sharing towards the end reminded me of the fact that as a graduate student also you gave me that opportunity to interact with your students back when you were still in Toyo. So thank you so much for that opportunity. And um, I think at this point um, we are ready to address uh, some of the questions um, posted by our um, participants, our attendees. And maybe, um, yeah, I just want the reactors and Professor Nakanishi also to be ready um, to uh, address them one by one and uh, allow me to read some of them. Uh, so the first question, uh, this is like a comment, okay, from somebody. Um, he says, he's been fortunate to have attended the fourth Philippine Studies Conference in Japan in 2018. And we would like to solicit comments from the academics. I believe the three of you can answer this. If his observation is valid that Philippine Japan studies scholars are most numerous now and more active compared to Philippine US or Philippine China or Philippine Australia studies. Uh, what do you think? What, is, what are your observations so far? Do you think it has been the most in demand or the most, I guess, active in terms of scholarship and, and uh, research? Who, who, who would like to answer that? Professor Nakanishi or what is your observation? Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, yeah. Philippine-Japan studies or yeah. relations are being yeah. more, more explored mm. or more prominent mm. now compared mm. to Philippine-US mm. or Philippine-China? Mm. Mm. What do you notice? Mm. Yes, um, I also be, um, attend the fourth Philippine Studies Conference mm. in year, uh, 2018. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, this conference was um, uh, managed by Philippine and the uh, Japan so cooperation. Mm. So, it's a reason why so there are so many Japanese so, uh, <laughs> scholars there. But I suppose there are so many um, yes, active, active uh, scholars in not only Japan, but also in US, China, and Australia. And I visited also in, I have, I have some friends in uh, Poland. So there's so, also so, uh, there's so many are uh, interested in the Philippines. So uh, I think so it is very, uh, so uh, good for us to 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 um, that kind of uh, international um, so, uh, collaboration to study about the Philippines and of course the two bilateral relationships between mm -hmm. Philippines and other countries. It was very happy for us. And uh, second, I, yeah. I, 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 I have some comment from the education. Uh, the project for my research field. So, um, frankly speaking, so there's so many scholarship in my research field, including mm. my um, my student also. After the tours, they just uh, create some fund to to assist them. But uh, as this is um, but um, the project of UP UP of cut project is. Only for the um, a, a little more the talented uh, students in my research field. So this is it wraps the edit the education system. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I, I think that the most important is education for all. So our mm -hmm. basis is education for all. And after that, we need some data to develop our localities. So this locality is always uh, depend on, for example, so Abogano, Abogano, young uh, lawyer or uh, doctors 
mega doctors on outside. But I suppose it's a bit now, it, it now, so we need just uh, from these localities. So in this case, um, in the Philippines also, in, in Japan also the same problem, but in also in the Philippines, your government or also I know that in university, there's some should, uh, can prepare such a scholarship program more. In Japan, mm. also, we have such problem. Mm. But yes, so this is my opinion. Thank yeah. you. Much. Yeah, I think uh, unless uh, Professor Yunenu Reyes, you have uh, inputs on that. Uh, I guess you also are a regular attendee of Philippine Studies Conference. <laughs> you might want to yeah, give your observations as well. Oh, yes. Actually, I did not understand very exactly the question. What the question is like, uh, uh, um, do you think the uh, scholarship or uh, maybe scholars doing Philippines, uh, Philippine Japan uh, relations or Philippine Japan uh, studies, Philippine studies, Japan studies, no, uh, both ways, have become more prominent in terms of maybe uh, research output or productivity or maybe involvement in conferences compared to Philippine China or Philippine US? Oh, oh okay, okay. Uh, I'm not sure. Actually, yeah. I think, okay, I think I can answer from a slightly different perspective mm. popularity in terms of the popularity of the Philippine studies. Yeah. Okay, uh, outside the Philippines. Yes, Japan is certainly uh, one of the regular, uh, what you say, uh, a group of uh, uh, hosts. Uh, Japan always hosts uh, a, a group of uh, a big, you know, group of scholars yeah. in mm -hmm. in the field of Philippine studies. Mm -hmm. uh, wherever the conferences that may be held, either in the Philippines or uh, Japan or Europe or or America. So yes, in that sense that Japan or Japanese Filipinologists are certainly responsible uh, for the development of the Philippine studies mm. uh, at large. But I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, at, at least, you know, the, 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 in terms of the size, size. or the size of number, yeah. yes, uh, uh, it is bigger uh, than like in China or South Korea, mm. or perhaps even than Australia yeah. uh, and other countries. But I'm not sure the America, the United States, yeah. because uh, today we see a number of uh, um, uh, excellent scholars uh, coming out, I mean, uh, are emerging, uh, especially including those Fil Fil Filipino Americans or the mm -hmm. second or third generation Filipino Americans mm -hmm. uh, uh, standing out in the United right. States. Right. Uh, so I'm not sure in terms of the number. And of right. course, the non Filipino rooted uh, American scholars also do Philippine studies uh, in the United States. So I'm not sure the America, but uh, otherwise, I, I, I agree that Japan is one of the important uh, uh, countries for the development of Philippine studies outside the Philippines. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Reyes. Uh, Professor Balescas, do you have inputs on this? Yeah. I think maybe the, um, the person who asked the question may want to, I hope he has written about it, may want to refer to Dr. Um, Patricio Abinales. My former student <laughs> in uh, UP uh, sociology. Now at University of Hawaii, Manoa. Yes, now he's yeah. now in the University of Hawaii. He, I think, he did a study about uh, who, uh, which, which country is now more studied by mm. the scholars. Uh, and I think he did mention, uh, if I remember correctly, that there's a significant number of studies in being made about Japan. Yes, more than America. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but mm, I, I, I thought that lingered in my mind. Mm -hmm. And this is contrary to the situation in 1976, because when we applied for scholarship and we had our orientation, uh, someone from UP, from Asian Center said, oh, you must be applying because you did not pass uh, the exams for America. Right. <laughs> I really stood up and I said, "Excuse me, I, I know, 
I mm. beg your pardon, but uh, please, you may be speaking for yourself, but mm. it's a choice for us to go to Japan. Mm. Uh, mm. But I can say this, uh, for migration studies, we have a lot of young mm. Filipino and uh, mm. scholars who are pursuing studies about uh, Filipino migrants, their children, their families, mm. women, uh, EPA nurses, caregivers, and then uh, males uh, are very rare, but they're increasing with the number of technical mm. uh, trainees being sent mm. to Japan. Mm. So uh, this is one direction that really you have so much, you have so much scholarship about. And right. I'm happy because uh, I, I was forced to uh, migration in 1992 from uh, agrarian reform it became a crossroad because of Maricris Shoson if you um, remember right. one, uh, one Filipina who died under uh, no, suspicious circumstances mm. it became a diplomatic crisis and that was the mm. time when the uh, Philippine embassy ambassador asked me to make a research about why were there so many Filipino women despite the danger despite the risk why were there hundreds, uh, thousands of Filipino women still going to Japan. Mm, and so yeah. the, my book in 1992 was Filipino Entertainers and Introduction. Mm. That, that started it. Yes. So I'm very happy. There are many young scholars like Joy, <laughs> many others. Yes. I benefited from that very humble work, ma'am, uh, to be able to write about Filipino migrant women in Japan. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, there's another question here because I think for the most of the reactions and the presentation of Professor Nakanishi focus on the university to university linkages. So there's a question here about the role of NGOs in supporting financially uh, students, indigenous students who wish to study in Japan or, but they do not have financial support. So I guess this is a lot easier if you get recommendations from your universities. But I, I guess the question comes from somebody who is interested to know whether there are some NGOs, Japanese or, or uh, you know, uh, maybe private or business sector kind of, you know, foundation or, or organizations that can support students who would like to go to Japan to study. Um, I think this is also being, I think we can link this also to the current flows of Filipinos going to Japan to become technical interns because they don't know which channels no, to uh, to go to, I mean, what, what are the safe, safe channels not to be able to go to Japan in order to work. But I think this question is particularly about what are the safe channels, maybe NGO assisted or I don't know, maybe some organizations assisting uh, Filipino students who want to go to Japan to study. Uh, mainly because we know uh, it's the Mumbusho Scholarship, no? it's the, the Japan government, uh, and then the university recommended kind of scholarship. No? But are there other channels you know or familiar with? Mm, yes, uh, Japan, as I said, is now on the global education mm. uh, period. And many universities in Japan, private universities, are, are directly directly accepting applicants. They don't have to go through UP for yeah. that. Uh -huh. yeah. Although UP has, uh, because they have 77 affiliated yeah. works yeah. in Japan. But uh, yes, uh, please look up in the internet, uh, look for Japanese universities, universities. And global education programs. Mm -hmm. That's one, one way you can enter Japan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they subsidize, uh, they have scholarships from under uh, yes, for, from college all the way up. Mm -hmm. NGOs, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, I think they're not identified with this kind of like education channels. I mean, NGOs do not provide education channels. I yes. think that's that's a misleading, I think uh, maybe, um, I don't know, maybe perception. Because I think NGOs, oh, it, this could be about the Japanese Filipino children or the Nikkei, maybe. The, the ones that assist, you know, so that they could go to Japan to to to, to Japanese work Filipino and children. But those Joy. are different, yeah. Uh -huh. Joy, if it's Japanese uh, Filipino children, there are networks like Dawn or yeah. Batis. Batis, oh. Maligaya yes. House, yeah. Yes. Then yes. Philippine Nikkei Jin Center. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. They may they may be able to assist them to link 
with their families, their Japanese connection in Japan, right. and that's how they're able to go to Japan. Yeah. But uh, for scholarships, uh, I think the mm. audience has to know, Takai desyo, it's very expensive, expensive. To, be, mm. to be educated in Japan. <laughs> yeah. On top of that, it's very expensive to be in Japan. Live. Mm. <laughs> the, the the standard of living is very expensive in Japan, so uh, that that makes it very doubly difficult for mm. any um, what NGO to support yeah. scholarships. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think Professor Nakanishi has some insights. Go ahead. Um, yes. Okay. In case of University of Tokyo, so before maybe about five or ten years ago, so all of the foreign students should study Japanese because all of our class was served in, was served in Japanese. But mm. today, mm. so you can graduate from uh, University of Tokyo without taking any class in Jap served in Japanese because many classes are served in, Jap in English also. So the language, um, maybe uh, the world is not uh, so high compared with uh, those days. And second good news is after K to 12, so uh, you are so Filipino people. So after you are graduating, for example, after graduating from uh, university uh, college, and you are so straight going to Japan's uh, graduate school. Before that, so before uh, K to 12, so you need two years more to study in university. So many of students, so very, um, they are very excellent, but still they have to study more, for example, in uh, Asian center. So they, you serve such kind of student. So, but uh, nowadays, so you are now, so K to 12. So for not four years, but six years high school, you are directly from uh, after graduating from uh, faculty to going to master course in Japan. Yes, thank you. Okay, the next question here is about, uh, let me see. Oops, 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 oops. Sorry, I lost my, my screen. Whoops. Okay, so the next question here is about uh, how can we maybe maximize uh, Japan-Philippine cooperation, not just in the academe, but also in other areas? How else can we uh, like expand or deepen the, the benefits of Japan-Philippine cooperation in the academe to other areas? Any, any inputs? <laughs> Okay, Professor Nakanishi, yes. Thank you. Hello, Professor Nakanishi, go ahead. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Can, can you hear? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. okay. Um, because in context of globalization, poverty elevation has been achieved, but inequality has increased, especially after year 2000. I think one of the reasons for there is a GAFA. GAFA has a monopoly on information and uh, this uh, information strategy. So um, for, for example, international capitalists can use it. So in order to counter, counter, or counteract this, I think it's possible to deepen the network within the locality and uh, create a counter maybe uh, some basis. This is one of the reasons why I am studying organic agriculture. So I think now we need um, maybe the uh, collaboration between localities, not only Philippines, but also Japan. Yes. Joy, I think you're muted. Okay. Uh, uh, like the the follow-up question to that because I think uh, there are, there have as, as as you have experienced, no, uh, Japanese scholars have been involved in local community, uh, local communities in the Philippines, 
Um, I wonder if you have, because I'm not aware so much uh, of Filipino scholars that are also doing something similar in development uh, um, related you know, initiatives. Because we do, like us doing migration studies, that's part of our uh, like research work uh, that we really immerse ourselves in uh, not just Filipino migrant communities, but even in the local communities where Filipinos are and where where they interact or, or work together with Japanese residents. Um, that's part of our ag research agenda. But I wonder if there are Filipino scholars or researchers that have been involved in maybe something similar, like for example, rural revitalization or uh, you know, urban uh, poverty, say, because Tokyo may be highly developed, but we all know homelessness is also visible, right? I wonder if you are aware, uh, Nakanishi Sensei. So, Somebody uh, doing mm, something mm. similar to what you're doing, but Filipino mm. scholars in Japan. Think about the, the study about the, the book. Um, Poverty, uh, urban, in Japan. yeah. Mm, yes. Mm, Japan. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, one of the problems is uh, maybe we can uh, find so many uh, homeless in Tokyo or mm. uh, even in Yokohama, I yeah. say. Sure. But uh, maybe the problem is um, the structure is a little different, a very different from that in the Philippines. So one of the reasons, for example, um, in the Philippines, of course in Japan we have uh, squatters very near Riverside, but the squatter in the Philippines are very different from those in Japan. Mm. Uh, because uh, one reason is, uh, for example, family. In, the, in Japan, most of uh, homeless has no family. But of course, mm. we have a, a poor family issue in Japan, so especially during pandemic. And uh, during uh, maybe after year 2000, uh, the income distribution is uh, uh, maybe uh, worse compared with uh, 1970 or 1980s. There's so many income distribution uh, problem in Japan. But still, um, the, maybe uh, the, maybe uh, we have some social welfare system, and uh, the, there are so many what to say uh, policy uh, policy um, policy makers a uh, policy agenda for government from scholars because uh, we have some. Uh, logistic of uh, such uh, social welfare, welfare system. But in the Philippines, maybe it's a little different, especially for the urban poor. I, I shared so for this 35 years. So uh, from this point, so the Filipino scholars can study also in the poverty in Japan, I think. But uh, uh, during the maybe, um, 1990 to year 2000. So I visit Sanya and Kamagasaki and uh, uh, Hino, Hinode Machi. So it is a pretty big slums area in Japan. But the, the, the situation is completely different from those in Philippines because they are protect, protected by NGOs also in the local government. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nakanishi. Do you have inputs related? Do you have, do you want to add to that, uh, Professor Baliescas or Professor Reyes? Like none, okay. Um, the other question, maybe this should be one, second to the last uh, that we should uh, get. Um, are there existing academic partnerships not only confined to UP, uh, wherein Filipino students are allowed to pursue further studies and conduct researches between the two countries' relationship. Um, yeah, I, maybe uh, Professor Reyes can mention, like, uh, aside from UP, maybe University of Shizuoka's other uh, um, universities that you collaborate with or, like, allow maybe Filipino students to come to your university and like from other institutions in the Philippines? 
Okay. My university has uh, the exchange pro pro program only with the University of the Philippines, from the Philippines. We have uh, other exchange uh, and the partnerships uh, with other universities outside of the Philippines. I understand that the other universities do have some uh, exchange programs with other Philippine universities. Certainly, Ateneo de Manila University, uh, uh, the De La Salle University, Siliman University, and uh, actually some other universities. Some some people from other universities have been approaching me if uh, we could explore the the, the connection. Uh, but my university at this very moment uh, is uh, is like too busy with the UP at this moment. But uh, but uh, I mean that uh, you know so it's I mean uh, certainly it is not confined to UP. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm by sorry. the way, by the, ah, way yeah. the, the new trend now is, of course, uh, uh, that the nursing schools and the caregiver mm. you know, schools are exploring. Uh, the, the connections with Japanese, uh, I don't know, universities or, or some technical schools, vocational right. technical schools or, or junior college, etc. Right. And uh, what I know is, uh, for example, the University of Tokyo and uh, there are some universities, Japanese universities, who come to, they, they come to Japan with their representatives and they do uh, have presentations and promoting some programs like MBA and all that um, to uh, admit uh, Filipino students and they subsidize tuition, something like that. So there has been a scheme like that happening in the recent years um, uh, in, which, in which Japanese universities do come to the Philippines to recruit students um, in their graduate programs with some tuition subsidies. Although I, I know, I remember Professor Asato, Wako Asato did a presentation on this and he said he cautioned um, that some of these uh, universities also use that scheme to get subsidies from the government or something like that to, um, and also exploit that channel um, to force some of these students to work and uh, um, to pressure them to pay the remaining balance in their tuition at a particular yeah. limited period of years. So I know somebody who has been in that uh, situation, um, she's still there in Japan and paying off her tuition because uh, I think unless she settles this, she would not get the credential or like um, they, they take hold of um, her, her uh, diploma or something. So yeah, um, some of these channels can be a bit, you know, um, suspicious and uh, maybe not, not cannot be considered um, I don't know, safe and, and uh, it might put uh, some Filipino students also in difficult situations, even if they think that would be a way for them to advance their degree or whatnot. But um, cannot be, I, I think it, this is not sustainable, I think, in the long run. Um, Ma'am Cherry, do you have, Professor Valescu, do you have some additional inputs on that, this? Maybe UP Cebu also has its own. Partner. Yes, UPC yes. has with mm. Toyo University mm. uh, that, that has been forged. And where else? Uh, I think they have in another university in Japan, Kansai. Kansai. Oh. Yes, yes. So mm -hmm. but I, I would like to raise the same caution that you, the same mm -hmm. alert. That you did. Mm. Uh, there are uh, unauthorized irregular channels mm. that will offer you. Uh, to study in Japan, their language, but it's a disguised form of uh, recruitment. So uh, please be cautious about that. Thank you. Especially in the chat box, there are quite uh, like one or two questions I, I, I saw that talked about, you know, re really wanting to go to Japan to study. So um, there are some channels that are not safe and not advisable for you to be able to pursue. So the safest way would be through the Japanese government um, scholarships and through the uh, university recommendations, either in Japan or in the Philippines. But you really have to check the requirements and you know the processes and, and how you can be admitted to the program. And see also how financially you, you're ready because it will entail costs definitely on your part. If it's not from the government or like, you know, bigger, um, I guess, organizations giving scholarships. 
Ma'am Cherry? We sponsor Japan Foundation has some scholarships for language. Language, for language training. Yes. So yes. Uh, please watch out for their application period for Japanese language. Yeah. 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 So uh, you can also go to Japan, but not on academic. Let's say uh, mm -hmm. you have the shift for Southeast Asia. It's a cultural thing. I'm right. not sure though, during the pandemic, it may have been stopped. Right. One outlet. Jaika, yeah. Jaika, Genesis. There's yeah. Genesis. Genesis. There's Jet yes. program for those who are, want to be uh, teachers. Come to Japan as teachers, language teachers. These yes, are the safe groups. channels. Yeah, uh, and grips as well. Ah, but that's more short. Yes. Yeah. Um, JDS for government uh, servants. This is scholarship uh, also given to public servants. Um, what else? ADB. A ADB also has a scholarship uh, for those who would like to get masters in business. They're only select courses or programs that they allow their um, uh, um, grantees to pursue in Japan. But these are safe channels um, to be able to study in Japan. You know, less so much of a financial burden on your end. Yeah. So I think uh, we'd like to wrap up as much as we'd like to address. Maybe if our panelists um, have the luxury of time, if you want to directly address the questions, you can do that. It's on Q&A and you can respond to these questions on your own. Um, but at this point, we'd like to close the public lecture session first. Um, and on behalf of the Asian Center, I'd like to extend my warmest gratitude to Professor Toro Nakanishi, Professor Michio Yoneno Reyes and Professor Cherry, uh, um, Cherry Baliescas for your uh, sure sharing your expertise, your great insights, um, and and uh, your experiences. Um, you know, being transnational academics um, over the last what three four decades, and uh, we have certainly benefited from your expertise today. Um, hopefully, this is not the last time we'll be seeing you. And uh, hopefully there'll be future um, engagements, no, uh, not just related to Japan, but related to you know Asian studies in general. And uh, thank you very much um, for your time, your energy, and commitment to this um, endeavor. And more to come in the future. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimashita. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and at this yeah. point, we'd like to have like some creativity break, maybe, uh, for everyone to maybe grasp first what transpired in this public lecture session um, and we shall reconvene at 3 15 um, to make way for the new breed of Japanese study scholars or researchers and to share their insights also on why they have been um, doing research about Japan uh, that's going to be up at 3 15 please uh, please uh, I hope you stay put Thank you.
All right, and we are back. Um, at this point, I'd like to call everyone's attention for the second part of our program uh, today, still celebrating the 101 years of academic linkages between the University of the Philippines and Japanese universities. It's my honor to present to you four, the four winners of the recently concluded Japanese Studies Research Competition that we organized last March. And they're here to share their insights on uh, their participation at the competition, also at the first convention on Japanese studies that uh, recently um, concluded. Um, and uh, we'd like to uh, give each of them 10 minutes to share those invaluable insights. We're starting off with uh, our undergraduate category winner, um, Jose Miguel Villarín from UP Cebu. Miguel, when you're ready. Oh, good afternoon, everyone, Dr. Salero. Uh, give me a few short moments to share my screen. While waiting, maybe we can also invite our audience to pay close attention to their sharing, and you might want to also field in some questions um, addressed to any of them, the four um, presenters, uh, student presenters. You may do that on the chat box. Thank you. Uh, sorry, on the Q&A box. Go ahead, Miguel. All right, thank you, Dr. Celero. Um, so before I share my insights on uh, my own journey with Japanese studies, starting with the Japanese research competition concluded last May, March 2021, and also the recently concluded Young Scholars Convention, the first ever Young Scholars Convention uh, hosted. I'd also like to thank uh, the entirety of the Asian Center, uh, Dean Sevilla, Dr. Celero, and the other faculty involved in facilitating these events uh, for us. Uh, this, this, it was a huge, especially as well to, I would also like to thank the Japan Foundation Manila, especially uh, Director Ben Suzuki and the rest of their staff for providing us an immense opportunity to be able to deepen our understanding and interest with Japan as an object of research, as something that we would like to learn more, their culture, uh, their history, and so on and so forth. I'd also like to thank, um, the uh, the panelists uh, the panel before us the uh, uh, was uh, started off by Dr. Nakanishi especially with their sharing with the research experience their research experiences and field work in the Philippines and relating their experiences between the Japan and Philippine relationship and as well as the entirety of the panel for sharing how research and inter-university connections have deepened and expanded opportunities especially for us right now younger scholars to understand or like contribute to the relationship between the two countries that is Japan and the Philippines, be it academic or the social uh, aspect of it. So uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is San Miguel Villarín. I am currently a third year undergraduate college student from the University of the Philippines, Cebu, from the College of Social Sciences. So when asked to give my own personal insights and reflection on how Japanese studies has uh, fair in the Philippines or how I went starting uh, going into Japanese studies, I felt a sense of nervousness and also an adequacy to provide a deeper or comprehensive walkthrough of my uh, own experience or even to contribute to what that was uh, discussed earlier in this event. But hopefully, uh, um, even though my formal entry to Japanese studies was through the competition hosted by Japan Foundation Manila and the Asian Center, um, I could still provide my own um, a unique perspective of like being an undergraduate starting off with their research uh, their research stint with like Japanese studies as their main field so um, Japan as an object of research has been a fully fulfilling experience for me to do it still continues to be as we participate in these intellectual and academic exchanges like the conventions and also the academic um, webinars being hosted by both institutions I mentioned a while ago. So there are three points that I would like to reflect on uh, at this uh, in this opportunity. First is um, first is on like uh, first is on like cultural. First is on a. So first is 
on like the cultural exchange. Wait, really sorry about this. My laptop is not cooperating. Anyways, yeah, reflecting on like the three points in this event, oh, um, specifically culture exchange, culture, lang culture and the intertwining of culture and language and the expansion of understanding our, both of our cultures here in Japan, uh, here in the Philippines and also in Japan. So the Japan-Philippine relationship goes on deeper than I previously thought before I entered into these conventions and into these like events. Prior to the conference with like the Jap or like the competition with the Japanese studies hosted by Asian the Asian Center, involving my paper submission and now my participation in this special lecture, reflecting on 101 years of Japan and Philippine relations in the academe. I thought that the relationship between our two countries was merely based off like pop culture influences, like how children, our children my age back then in the Philippines are fueled by imagination of Japanese in animation like Voltron or whatever, or like culture as people uh, in Japan also seek out the same way in our, in, their, in our food, in our films, and also other forms of material culture. So like um, going back to like reflecting how particularly the Young Scholars Convention provide an avenue for all of us young scholars to understand and like learn more about like different facets of Jap Japan as a nation, its culture and how it is progressing. Like especially when Dr. O'Malley and other young scholars shared on the first day of our convention that attempts been made both in the past and the present to exchange culture through means of music and theater. I found this to be a very inter interesting discussion. Uh, having to see like through the recordings and video um, presentation shared of Filipinos having to interpret Philippine history, our own history, through a Japanese form of theater. It was something that I did not know about and was honestly not what I expected when it came to like being able to understand Japan and Philippine relations. The, the, consequently, the, also the discussions on the author Murakami and had also been engaging. And these are insights coming from someone myself who has never picked up a Murakami book in his life, nor even a single paragraph from it. Discovering how Murakami has taken the world in imaginative ca captivity, as like I would like to call it, through their writings, through their characters, had left a strong impression on me as like how Dr. Guevara, during on the second day of our convention, along with other participants readily shared their thoughts on his authorship and his writings. Um, moving on is like uh, also having to learn Nihongo through like Jen Sensei's discussions on the second day of our recently concluded convention also provided a refreshing perspective on the intertwining of culture and language and how learning one should not be without also learning the other. From those discussions, I was able to realize the necessity of understanding language and also understanding culture to appreciate both of them. That learning a language on its own is useless without learning the cultural context in which it was done, it was written, it was used first. Although I had my own difficulties learning basic words and phrases in Nihongo, and I believe most of the participants today are also sharing the same experiences of being able to push themselves into learning a language totally different from Tagalog or my own native language, Cebuano, or English, the session pushed me to greatly appreciate the language and also the grammatical concepts like a, like a kego or the formal speech or the in and out groups being, um, being considered when talking to or like, or having to engage in a Japanese conversation. And lastly, the, on the last day of the Japanese, uh, the Young Scholars Convention, the discussions coming from Dr. Vilog, Dr. Celero and Dr. San Jose, all emphasize the tra current trajectory of research in an ever-expanding Japanese culture, moving away from the idea that Japan is a merely monolithic society, it, that um, it is a homogenous society, towards multiculturalism or accepting diversity in culture, something that is very relevant to my paper, which was submitted in the Japanese studies research competition last March. So during that competition, I was able, and also tying back to the discussions made by um, other scholars during our convention, I was able to position my own paper, my own writing, to submit it to the third Japanese studies research competition on Hafu, Never Fall Vulnerabilities of Japan's Mixed Race Minority Under the Pandemic. 
which I presented again last March 2021. Um, relating to this, like Dr. San Jose's discussion on the existing debates in the academe, especially in the field of Japanese studies, allowed me to gain a better perspective or an understanding of where to situate my writing in a vasty of other papers with young scholars or even um, more established scholars within Japanese studies as a research field. My paper was based on the theory of Nihon Jinron. Uh, where the question of Japanese-ness was being constantly questioned and answered differently time and time again through the cultural and historical experience of Japan as a nation, from its Sakoku or closed borders era to its contemporary attempts at multiculturalism. The question of Japanese identity had been the make it or break it factor in the acceptance of ethnic minorities and other racial groups, some uh, groups which I tackle or particularly like mixed race children in my paper, Hakuna Number Four. Um, at best, Dr. San Jose provided an explanation that multiculturalism right now in Japan is merely for cosmetics rather than meaningful change. Although there are multiple attempts right now, especially coming from the younger generation in Jap Japanese society, to see more or like to go beyond cosmetic multiculturalism. So in my paper, I also explain how the adverse impacts of the pandemic on an economic and social level has made it even harder for mixed race Japanese people to navigate Japanese society than ever before. Um, I could relate this to how Dr. Vilog touches on the politics of recognition of the Nikkei Jin, something that a term that has been mentioned in this lecture, the descendants of Japanese citizens who immigrated to different countries in Japan's like darker or like trying economic period where at present the re-entry to Japanese society is still met with significant challenges as they are branded as they're too foreign, they don't look Japanese enough. So the struggle of the Nikkei Jin is also synonymous, I believe, with that of the mixed race Japanese, that being not Japanese enough, which makes it even difficult for them to immigrate both on a personal and like a material level. The language that surrounds the description of Hafu, or the mixed race Japanese people in Japan, is one of lacking or incomplete through terms like hafu, which is in English, half, or even being mistaken and being referred to as kai kokojin or gaijin, foreigner, by their own, uh, by their own ja uh, fellow Japanese citizens, uh, despite them having just, uh, despite them having Japanese ancestry in their blood, leaving them on a personal and cultural crossroads, not having a nation to truly call home. So within my paper, I discussed the pragmatic implications of pervading Nihon Jinron or like the Japanese nest debate currently in academic spaces. And also right now, especially on the advent of social movements all around the globe, especially at the start of the pandemic, like Black Lives Matter, wherein they now, but in Japan, the question is not because of police brutality or um, structural, uh, structural racism, like in the US, but in Japan, it's more of having to acquire shelter, like being discriminated by landlords to uh, being discriminated by landlords in terms of like acquiring homes or shelter, being able to access healthcare without um, limitations or without discrimination or being able to interact with their local government and actually have representation, uh, which some local government units have in Japan have strived to create through policy making, through creating anti-discrimination ordinances in their local context. Uh, tokenistic or cosmetic forms of multiculturalism as described uh, in our um, sharings in the convention, recently concluded convention is absolutely and definitely inadequate as a response to a now growing population of racial minorities in Japanese society in the face of its rapidly aging workforce. So as multiculturalism becomes a more pressing issue, in the field of Japanese studies, the study of those in between Japanese society can be considered as a important piece in this big puzzle where Japan navigates itself from its misconceptions of a homogeneous society that everyone yeah, is Japanese. I think you need to wrap up. I think you need to conclude now. You're, mm. you're going over time. Please conclude. Yeah. So the discussions from esteemed speakers in the recently concluded convention and here in the special lecture Having personally and it has personally energized me in seeking out and making sense of exactly new developments in the field of Japanese studies, especially the Philippine and Japan relation and multiculturalism in Japan. I once again thank 
Nation Center, the Japan Foundation Manila, and esteemed speakers for um, being able to provide us an opportunity to share the same space. Um, and I greatly thank all of, all of the people who strive to get me here this far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. On to our next presenter who will share um, her insights uh, at the competition, the convention, uh, Ms. Katrina Principe, who is an MA student at the Asian Center. Take it away, okay? Thank you, Dr. Celero. Konnichiwa, hajime mashte. Kades, um, I am pleased to be part of this special lecture on Jap Philippine Japanese uh, Philippines Japan relations featuring Dr. Toru Naka Nakanishi and our invited reactors, Dr. Michio Yoneno Reyes and Dr. Maria Rosario Piquero Baliascas. Allow me to thank the organizers, the UP Asian Center, led by Dean Henelita Sevilla Jr., and the Japan Foundation Manila or JFM, led by Director Ben Suzuki, for this opportunity to share my reflections on Japanese studies in the Philippines through my participation in the third Japanese studies research competition and the recently concluded first ever Young Scholars Japanese Studies Convention organized by JFM. So my interest in Japan started with, like most of our participants, its culture. I love Japanese food. I grew up watching Japanese cartoons, animated movies, series. I wish the Philippines has four seasons so we can also enjoy Sakura season. I love the polite and respectful language, uh, the greetings, the gestures. Japan, while seemingly close in proximity as one of our neighbors in Asia, is very different from us. We are part of each other's history, but also beyond it. Um, I was drawn to its exoticism. Japan is unique. It was my exposure at work in Picard, one of the sector planning council of the Department of Science and Technology, that led me to learn more about Japan beyond the things I'm initially interested in. Before pursuing Northeast Asia as a major in Asian studies at the UP Asian Center, I never fully understood Japan's many forms of paradox. For example, uh, Japan developed into modernity along a path that was very different from other nations on the other side of the world. With a strong, well-defined culture, Japan, even with its hierarchic culture with a tendency to emphasize traditions and the past, manages to be creative, innovative, competitive, thus turning itself into a technological global power on its own terms. Understanding this contrasting image of Japan is just one of the motivations I had or I have for pursuing a Japanese research. And such characteristic of Japan, to be honest, excites and sometimes frustrates me. So as I reflect on my experience, allow me to share uh, three major realizations. First, Japanese studies is part of a broader academic and development agenda. I owe this realization to the program at the Asian Center and specifically Dr. Celero because it was during our classes and our discussions that I observed that the study of Japan has gone beyond the narrow confines of, say, a small generally uh, minority subject of studying, for example, its history or language or culture, um, although those are very integral parts of the puzzle in examining Japan. It had become part of a broader intellectual agenda and even the national development agenda in the Philippines. Um, Japan with its rich experience in industrialization and modernization provides a benchmark, um, a model for many developing countries, one that we continue to dissect and analyze, but at the same time, uh, Japanese studies have evolved to producing um, specialized research findings in a broader context um, across different scientific disciplines. Uh, Japanese studies e employs various methodological perspectives, as well as rely on other disciplines and subjects that can have an entirely different orientation. My second point is closely related to the first. Um, I conceptualized my research paper titled Encouraging the Next Generation of Farmers in Japan, a Results Chain Framework Analysis for our class uh, during a semester where wherein I was struggling to find my niche in area or Asian studies. And uh, because my background is different from my classmates, uh, and second, my work and research interests, agriculture er and uh, the rural areas, um, they are not sexy subjects for Japanese or Asian studies. Um, I constantly ask myself, what can I contribute to the field? How can I use and apply um, Asian studies at work? So the experience of writing and sharing in a class or to a wider audience, including the opportunity to submit it for publication, um, however intimidating that was, made me realize how Japanese studies encompass other disciplinary fields. 
and the significance of Japan in the contemporary discourse. Japanese studies have transcended boundaries. And by analyzing in Japan's context, we can relate its expression to wider academic concerns. One just needs to really engage in the literature to discover this. And as my advisor would often say, you just need to write about it, share it, edit, repeat. So in the process of writing the research paper, I initially wanted to only learn from Japan's experience, take note of the lessons, the best practices, and that is the common approach or the traditional perspective of seeing Japan as a role model. However, the process allowed me to be familiar with cross-regional issues um, that countries in Northeast Asia share, including China and Korea, um, the nature of interdependencies among them, and the opportunity for richer comparisons and cross-validation. Third and equally important, uh, equally an important lesson I wanted to share today is that participating in Japanese studies contributed to a deeper knowledge of the Philippines. It did instill the value and emphasis of the importance of having an acute awareness of our own country's experience. And such, I think, is aligned to Asian Center's training, um, you know, uh, practicing self-reflexivity. So to describe this realization, um, I attempted to be poetic. So I'm sharing with you my first ever English haiku. Land of rising sun, ignite search in the blue sea, pearl of the orient. So and that for me will serve as a reminder of the value of pursuing Japanese studies. Lastly, to end my sharing, it is important to provide and for young scholars who are keen in and about Japan to take advantage of the platforms for exchange and interaction of imagination, ideas, and analysis of Japan. The Young Scholars Japanese Studies Convention is just one of the examples of a form of a learning environment that ensures the continuity of Japanese studies in the Philippines and its scholarship. The importance of exposure to a wide range of topics under Japanese studies, as I can attest through my experience, uh, contributes significant, significantly to its appreciation. Hence, um, as I am revising my research paper uh, submitted during the competition, I am looking forward to including and highlighting how partnerships and our longstanding diplomatic ties with Japan contribute to addressing the shared challenges in our agriculture sector. I'm currently learning more about this program, such as the Young Filipino Farm Leaders Training Program in Japan. This is led by our Department of Agriculture. And hopefully, we'll get some insights on um, or from the Japanese farmers or trainers on what they have learned from our young Filipino uh, farmers. And that just to reinforce that two-way learning that we try to nurture between Philippines and Japan. In closing, uh, through the many collaborative and cross-institutional exchanges and programs that the Philippines and Japan have implemented and sustained through the years, the future is indeed promising for Japanese studies in the Philippines. I am pleased and looking forward to being a part of expanding and enriching that shared learning space uh, between the Philippines and Japan beyond the walls of our university. So thank you for your kind attention. Um, to our professors, happy World um, Teachers Day. Thank you for continuing to inspire us as we delve deeper into Japanese or Asian studies. Um, arigato gozaimashita. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Kay. And what really makes me proud of you is the fact that you're a China studies major and you venture in this world, you know, with so much courage and and and, and perseverance. So you your your efforts have been rewarded well. So thank you so much. Uh, our third presenter is another UP student, um, and uh, from the Master of International Studies program, Mr. Anton Miranda. Anton, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Dr. Celero. Okay, so um, let me just fix my uh, screen. Okay, so to our distinguished speakers, faculty, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Konnichiwa. I'm honored to share some insights on the current state of Japanese studies in the Philippines based on my reflection on the JFM Young Scholars Convention that I attended last month together with my co-panelists. Before I begin, I would like to express my sincerest gratitude to the uh, Japan Foundation and UP Asian Center not only for giving me the opportunity to attend the convention, but to also offer takeaways uh, for today's session. So to provide a short background on my research interests in Japan, I presented a paper on Philippine Nikkeijin during the third Japanese studies research competition back in March of this year. 
The convention of Japan Foundation was really helpful in enriching my understanding on Nikkei Jin and multiculturalism in Japan, since the speakers were able to share their findings based on in-depth interviews with Nikkei Jin families and new ones' perspectives on Japanese society and culture. Their presentations reminded me that there is still more to learn about Japan, which requires dedication and openness to new ideas. So for my short uh, reflection, uh, this will be summarized into three main points. First, people-to-people -people exchanges have become the driver of contemporary relations between Japan and the Philippines. Second, there is a need to strengthen Japanese language education during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And third, the rejection of cultural essentialism has emerged as a common agenda for Japanese studies in the Philippines. So for my first point, it can be observed that people-to-people -people exchanges are now taking the lead in bridging Japan and the Philippines towards mutual understanding. State actors no longer monopolize the sharing of cultures, given that various efforts, efforts have been made by academic institutions such as UP Asian Center, students, professionals, NGOs, and diaspora communities. These exchanges tend to be more informal and spontaneous compared to official diplomatic exchanges, which make them more conducive to candid views on each other's values and traditions. In this trend, the role of individuals and ja of Japanese and Filipino descent is crucial, for they are the bearers of both cultures. Based on the studies on Filipino Cajun and Shin Nikkei families presented by Dr. Ron Bilog and Dr. Celero during the convention, these individuals are not only exposed to both Philippine and Japanese worldviews, but they can also use their cultural capital to their advantage in effectively communicating between the two societies. In addition, globalization is a contributing factor for intensified exchanges. Prior to the pandemic restrictions, uh, robust cross-border movements between Filipinos and Japanese have been spurred by various scholarship opportunities, as well as business activity and deregulated migration channels, among others. For my second point, I had a few realizations from the crash course on Japanese language during the convention, which was facilitated by Jen Hieda-sensei. First of all, teaching Japanese, let alone any foreign language, in the middle of a pandemic is very challenging to do. Although online modalities such as Zoom and Google Meet have their advantages, it is still prone to complications that will affect the ability of students to build Japanese proficiency compared to a face-to-face -face setting. Given that language training is very interactive in nature, several factors have to be considered in adjusting to online methods, especially practicing writing, conversational skills, and expressing one's thoughts in Japanese. Furthermore, there is a need to update some of the materials and pedagogical strategies in teaching Japanese to make it more up applicable to the contemporary life in Japan. Uh, for example, Hieda Sensei noted that textbooks such as Genki and Mina no Nihongo are still widely used. However, I think some of their practice dialogues or kaiwa may need to be updated so that it is more relatable to students who may go to Japan in the future. Uh, for example, like buying a new cell phone or applying for health insurance. Making these adjustments would encourage more students to become more invested in studying the language. Last but not the least, the topics and discussions of the convention and even um, today's special seminar on Japan-Philippine relations strongly encourage us to develop critical perspectives on Japanese society and culture. This is consistent with current scholarship on Japanese studies that collectively rejects cultural essentialism, in which Japan is frequently projected as unique or unchanging. By delving on topics such as ethnic minorities, subcultures, and migration, Japanese studies in the Philippines has progressed through its unifying research agenda of debunking the myth of Japan's racial homogeneity. Although pop culture such as manga and anime has been instrumental in introducing Japanese culture, culture to younger audiences, this should only be a starting point in their intellectual journey in which they are invited to join deeper conversations about Japan. In relation, uh, Jap uh, traditional Japanese culture is actually becoming more receptive to external influences. So as mentioned by my uh, colleague, uh, Miguel, on the first day of the convention, Dr. Amparo Umali shared some clips of Filipino no and kabuki. Uh, I was personally intrigued on what were the reactions of the Japanese masters on Filipino versions of their art form. 
But this is a strong indicator that people are becoming more creative in introducing Japan to the rest of the world while ensuring that their traditions are preserved in contemporary times. As Japan is making gradual steps in interacting with other cultures, there is a need to deepen multiculturalism or multi deepen multiculturalism discourses amid the growing visibility of ethnic minorities in the country. This includes the Zainichi Koreans, the Ainu, and the 250,000 strong Filipino community in Japan. As explained by Dr. Benjamin San Jose during the convention, Japan has been promoting the concept of tabunka kyose, or multicultural coexistence, which is largely cosmetic in nature and is not considered as a national policy. Moving forward, uh, scholars can be supported in collecting and sharing the narratives of these minorities, which in turn may pro produce meaningful policy proposals on their welfare. So to conclude my reflection, I would like to raise the following points of discussion on the possible directions for the contingent growth of Japanese studies in the Philippines. So first, track 1.5 diplomacy channels can be strengthened to deepen social cultural relations between Japan and the Philippines, alongside networking uh, opportunities among scholars such as this, Unofficial exchanges among government officials, academe, and other stakeholders may elicit constructive responses or even positive changes from the top level. Second, there is an urgent need to ensure the continuity and safety of academic exchanges in a post-pandemic context. The Japanese government recently lifted the state of emergency in Tokyo and other prefectures after recording a remarkable decline in COVID-19 cases. Um, this development may have bearing in resuming student exchanges, student exchanges to Japan while establishing necessary health protocols to ensure their, that the journey is safe. Third, cultural exchanges between Filipinos and Japanese can progress in a more reciprocal manner in which more Japanese scholars can study and write about the Philippines by expanding and institutionalizing Philippine studies in Japan. Much has already been said on how Filipino scholars can deepen their appreciation of Japan. So this begs the question on how Japanese nationals can learn more about the Philippines, such as its language, its ethno-linguistic diversity and colorful history. And I'm very happy that I, I was able to hear from uh, Nishimura Sensei on his own research and experiences of studying in the Philippines. So with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Domo arigato gozaimashita. Thank you very much, Anton, and uh, by the, who, by the way, is from the Department of Foreign Affairs. So you you sort of inserted some bits of your being, uh, you know, working for that uh, government agency in your presentation. Thank you for that. And last but not the least, from the Philippine Studies uh, Foreign Relations Track of the Asian Center, our fourth presenter is Mr. Donald Bagasina. Donald, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Ma'am Celero. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Am I clear, Bob? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. So once again, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to Asian Center, to the Japan Foundation, and to our esteemed speaker and reactors for the celebration of the 101st uh, Japan, uh, Philippine Japan relations. Thank you. And as the last speaker among the winners of the uh, last Japanese research uh, competition, I'm going to share my insights on how I developed my interest of studying uh, Japan by exploring and engaging Japan through its foreign policy. This would be a reflection of Japanese studies in my perspective and lens as a Philippine studies uh, student uh, specializing in foreign relations. So most of my subjects in my master's class are focused on Philippine studies and its relations uh, with other countries. But when I had an opportunity to take uh, an elective course, I took AS236.2, uh, which is under the guidance of uh, Professor Celero, and there we studied about politics and governance of Japan. That was my first official and formal uh, encounter with uh, Jap Japanese studies as a focus of study. So during that semester, I was exposed through different facets of how Japan evolved 
within its political and governance realm, talking about different uh, facets of uh, the structure in itself, I, uh, I then realized that there is an opportunity for me to work on foreign relations within Japanese studies as my field of interest. And that is where I developed my interest of discussing and uh, writing papers about Japan's foreign policy. So it all started with an elective course. And after a year and a half, I'm still engaged with uh, different platforms provided by Japan Foundation, which I'm very thankful uh, for, for the opportunity. And under Professor Celera's guidance, I was able to attend on the 18th International Conference on Japanese Studies. This is where I was really exposed to different topics. Like, there's so much to talk about Japan beyond its political and government structures. I can explore culture, literature, as well as societal norms and connect it on how foreign policy is crafted from its domestic landscape. And this opportunity, which happened last January 2020, really opened more um, topic and interests where I can work on. And from the paper that I presented during this conference, I also joined the Japanese Studies Research Competition, released my paper looking on the Pacific Initiative and its impact on Japan-ASEAN relations. In my paper, my objective is to look into how Japan, as a stable nation when it comes to foreign policy, uh, look into its foreign engagement from Yoshida Doctrine to Fukuda Doctrine. And now we are in a new era of the free and open Indo-Pacific initiative. So in my paper, my objective is just to look into how this FOI was conceptualized. Where, where does this concept came from? And how it is um, affected by the development, uh, domestic development as well as con uh, contemporary issues within Japanese society and relate it on the importance of Southeast Asia, particularly the Philippines, on its impact towards our cup of foreign policy. Um, while taking Japanese, I then realized that approach the way how we study its culture. It has to be multidimensional. So foreign policy must be approached not only within the established politics and administrative uh, structures, but must also be analyzed through its culture, structural norms, as well as the way how its language play a role uh, in the conceptualization of its foreign policy. And this is something that I want to work on in the future as an aspiring young scholar of uh, Japan studies, to integrate a wider understanding of Japanese culture and how uh, th that established culture uh, play a big role in Japan's engagement in the international community. Now, based on the paper that I presented in, in the last um, Japan's competition, where I, where I discuss about the free and open Indo-Pacific Initiative, I want to put uh, emphasis on Japan's proactive role or contribution towards peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific by advocating for freedom and democracy. Something which I picked from uh, Sir Toru Nakanishi's um, presentation a while ago. When uh, Nakanishi-sensei talked about the importance of peace for deepening and extending our academic networks for the next generation of scholars, I connected it with the way how Japan is forging its contemporary foreign policy putting emphasis on stability and peace, which is something that is different from the previous doctrines uh, that the country espoused in the entire Asia Pacific. Now, as Japan moves towards its proactive contribution to peace and stability, and as an aspiring scholar, it would be an opportunity for me to study more about how Japan uh, focuses more on its political and security cooperation 
from the usual economic cooperation and people to people center uh, people to people approach that it had before so to conclude my discussion by looking at japan's foreign policy we should look at it not on its facade on the way how it is branded by the media on how it is driven by opinions of people looking at it but there must be a scrutiny from within. We need to look at how government policies, its culture, its societal norms, as well as the issues or societal issues happening within the country. And as the Philippines within Southeast Asia, Japan is an important partner in decades and in the future to come. And it is uh, with great pleasure to be part of a growing network of young scholars that would continue the legacy of some scholars from the Philippines who have studied Japan for so long. And I'm thankful for the opportunity given by the Asian Center, by the Japan Foundation, and I hope that we can contribute further in establishing and further developing Japanese studies in the Philippines. Thank you very much. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Donald. And at this point, I'd like to invite our four young scholars of Japanese studies um, to maybe uh, interact with me uh, with uh, some of the questions that I raised here. Since we don't have questions uh, from the audience, or maybe at this point, maybe we would like to encourage our audience maybe to maybe type in your questions if you do have questions or insights or comments based on the sharings of our four uh, young scholars. Okay. So thank you very much, the four of you, for uh, sharing generously you know, this afternoon all your experiences. I'm sure some of our audience um, have become inspired by your current study you know, of Japan. And hopefully this is a uh, start of so many other things to come, you know, so many research directions that we would like to pursue in the future. You know? um, so one of the questions I uh, thought about while listening to, you, uh, to your uh, presentations is that uh, maybe you might, might want to share with our uh, audience uh, because when you were writing your research papers, it was already in the, the midst of the pandemic, no? Um, maybe you can share a little bit about your challenges in writing your papers. How did you, what were the challenges, uh, difficulties that you've encountered and how were you able to overcome that to be able to write a, a decent paper, no? Um, not just for the competition, but also for the courses that you were taking at the university. Okay, so uh, so also maybe uh, this will be helpful tips also for uh, some of our audience who are students and might be interested in joining the next Japanese Studies Research Competition, no? that the fourth cycle. Okay, who'd like to start? Who's ready? Um, I see Kay. Kay, you look you look most ready. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I'm not. Okay, okay. So you're processing. Who's 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 ready? Um, youngest Miguel, are you ready? You might want to share. Maybe we start with you because you're the baby. Uh, how did you write your half or never full paper? Like, what were the challenges you experienced? How were you able to get by? Uh, yeah. Hello, professor, and hello, everyone. Um, I think the most challenging thing was you. Uh, searching for sources that were like very precise and to like the context of the situation, especially the research, uh, especially with the research question I posed in the paper about like mixed race uh, Japanese, which is um, emerging yung study pa since um, uh, recent lang yung revival of the issue about like. Uh, multiculturalism because of the pandemic and inequality issues. So that was a huge uh, problem for me at the beginning since uh, uh, you, there is a great difficulty of searching papers, searching textual like documents, or like I even had to like dig up and like try to understand like kanji or like certain characters in like official documents just for me to understand like primary sources or primary documentation about the issue. I think it really pushed me personally in terms of research, like trying to be innovative and creative and where I'm looking, how I'm analyzing things. And that's something I think most of the people, uh, especially young researchers are currently struggling as well. 
So, yun yung challenges ko. Okay. Kay? And then Anton and then Donald. Thank you, ma'am. Um, fortunately, uh, my research had uh, very good um, sources of data because it's official documents and uh, such. Um, what I struggled with is actually um, refining and sharpening my ideas. I don't have anyone to talk to it uh, to to about it uh, because of the limitations of of or online classes or, um, of course, I we can always consult to Doctor Silero, but sempre. Um, Hindi lang naman yun yung klase niya. But um, yeah, that, that personal discussion about a research topic, sometimes you just have to bear it on your own and process it on your own and find your own um, way of, of how to write the research paper. Um, and that's, you know, a part of area studies is also research at a distance. So um, it's, it's just another, it's just finding ways to, to, to make it happen despite the limitations brought by by the pandemic but hopefully we can get to do field research for then and field validation so that we can add value to to what we're trying to research about i guess it also helps uh, but we we didn't do this because it was very um uh, i guess exhausting um we could have done a seminar yeah, approach to you know doing presentations and getting feedback from your classmates it was something that we skipped because i was a bit afraid about you know some already being stressed out when others are making progress ahead of them so it doesn't like help them move forward whenever they see that other classmates are miles away like that was something i also sort of did away from at, during last year um yeah but I, I i thought i was i was also being generous in providing guidance at least um anyway anton hi yes, thank you dr celero um yes yeah, so Given that my paper was about Nikajin, the main challenge is I have no access to respondents. So I didn't have primary data at all to begin with. So that was the main challenge I had to confront. So what I had to do, given that um, uh, I was writing the paper and then it the pandemic happened, so the classes were cut short into online. So um, what I had to do with that circumstances was that I had to be very creative with my methodology and data collection. So given that um, primary data was not an option at at that time, so I had to look for other sources. So I checked papers already done by other scholars who did who did interviews on Nikajin. So uh, I actually cited works of Dr. Vilog and also Dr. Uh, Yoneno Yone Reyes. So thank you very much for that. And also uh, it's important to have guidance on the paper as well. So uh, Dr. Silvera, thank you so much for your guidance in that paper. So um, yeah, so you have to be very, very resourceful and creative um, in managing with the scopes and limitations of your paper. Yeah. I guess another one I'd like to add is another way you can contribute to the already you know well explored topic is the way you frame your argument. If it's it's it if it has a different theoretical framework or perspective that you're bringing into the table, again that adds freshness to a topic that's also already been tackled. And I think if you're able to sincerely communicate you not know, to your readers that this is how you want to look at the issue. Uh, that is like a departing from how previous scholars, you know, have have uh, you know approached the topic. Then this is something also maybe worth exploring and maybe stretching yourself a little bit, uh, you know, by familiarizing yourselves with the already existing theoretical perspective, so that you can bring in something else, you no, know, that has not been used yet. So I think yeah, you can contribute in th theoretical, methodological, and in, in uh, uh, maybe a, a analytical approach. Uh, because you might want to look at the topic from a different angle. And, and that is something that uh, I think worth exploring too, especially if you have limited uh, sources uh, for your data and, and yeah, yeah, like that. Okay, Donald, please. Thank you, ma'am. So on my case, I was a little bit lucky because I already attended a semester uh, with Dr. Celera and on that semester, that's where I started writing the topic. So I just continue and continue improving it. So there was already a guidance at the beginning before pandemic. But during the pandemic, the, the challenge was really uh, the turn of events. Because since I'm working on a foreign policy and whenever there are movements from other countries, there would be movements of, on the policy. So there is no fixated content when it comes to the paper. So. My advice would be when you are talking about current issues or contemporary issues that needs updating all the time, uh, you really need to invest on reading, 
uh, monitoring uh, the development of uh, certain issues or problems. Always subscribe to news outlets, credible news outlets. Uh, Japan newspapers and um, online websites are really accessible. Even their government websites are providing uh, white papers and um, detailed programs which you can use as your uh, primary analysis so you just really need to be creative as what anton said you need to be creative and um you need to explore all options you have within you while we are under the pandemic that would not limit you from engaging on topics which you can research on so maybe there are topics that you can work right now but it doesn't mean that you need to end there maybe you you invest your time on other matters that you can do considering your limitations thank you Thank you, Donald. Okay, and my next question is, um, from what you have attended, not the convention and all the papers presented during the research competition where you were also one of the contestants, and today's, uh, up to today's uh, special lecture no, on Japan-Philippine uh, relations, focusing on the academic linkages, um, tell me about your uh, observation so far on how the interest among Filipino students um, have shifted uh, in, in relation to studying Japan? Do, do you notice some shifts in terms of interest or like themes that are being explored? Um, and in a way, do you recognize that there have been changes in the way uh, the study of Japan is being, being done by you know, Filipino students like you? Because you've, you've heard from today, you know, like we have more senior scholars that really, um, you know, went on their journey of discovering, you know, studying Japan and, and pursuing a, a degree or even, you know, some research projects related to Japan. Um, so what's your take as young scholars this time? What are your observations so far? Okay, uh, how about we start with Kay and then Anton and then Donald and then Miguel, the baby as the last. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Ma'am, I think I, I, you can relate, and of course, our, our professors can also relate that Japanese studies is a journey that you start from, you know, um, about culture, about things you like and things that interest you. But when you get more exposed to, um, I'm not saying serious issues, but other issues that concerns J Japanese studies, um, it sparks, you know, uh, a different uh, perspective as a young scholar, I mean, I can uh, I can observe from the the convention that most of my co participants were interested in language or in in the arts. But then uh, at the third session, they were uh, being exposed to you know um, um, to to other issues that are relevant to Japanese studies. And um, by the discussion at the end of that, I can see you know most of them getting interested in those topics as well. So um, that's what I try to advocate as well to my colleagues that to get exposure to different things about Japan because Japan is, you know, um, a bigger area to explore, not just its culture. Right. But of course, it's integral, but, you know. Yeah. Okay, I agree with you that we always start with what's, what we're, you know, whatever aspect of Japan we, we uh, that that excites us. We, that's always the starting point. But then it, it shouldn't be diminished to you know our interests such as manga or anime because I mean that's the entry point. But there's so much more that you can explore. Uh, you know when we study Japan as an area of studies. Okay, Anton. Yes. Um. Actually. Um. I agree with you, Dr. Seder, and also Kat. Um. Uh. For many of our uh, young scholars. Um. Their starting point in Japanese studies is always anime, manga, or pop culture. So although, yes, it is a good starting point, however, we should not stay there. So there is a need to go into deeper questions about Japan. Um, reflecting on my personal experience as well as a Japanese studies minor in Ateneo, um, when during that during that time like we were all um excited to learn about the language but then later on as we progress in studying japan we already delved into um deeper topics about japan like its politics its culture its history so we there was a lot there, there was a lot more research agenda or topics that we can explore on and build our niche in and right now um for graduate studies um i think one of the main or recurring themes that I always see is about migration issues, issues in Japan. So um, given that we have a large diaspora community uh, in 
in Japan. I think that's always a source of inspiration for scholars to really um, put their foot on the ground, uh, to really uh, explore on how they can contribute to the current literature. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So just like uh, everyone's observation, uh, pop culture really played a big role in our introduction to Japan. But it proves that Japan's soft power diplomacy is really effective, that it can capture us and then convert us into scholars who would deal further about its, uh, the intricacies of its culture and society. But uh, as I observed, we are studying Japan's pop culture, not only in its uh, cultural aspect, but also how it is used as um, a storage of power, uh, of influence on how it connects people and migrates people. And I, I saw a lot of paper really connecting uh, Japan's food, uh, the gastro diplomacy, sports when it hosted Tokyo 2020 and its implications to diplomacy. And then we have its manga, among others. So from a very popular and common point into vast opportunities of uh, research topics, I, I really observe the conversion and you know, uh, the integration of these soft power policies uh, into a greater and more serious or more academic as well as more relevant topics. So there's a continuity, there's an improvement, and it's really happy to see that it started from something and then it became some uh, another thing uh, in, in terms of research. Yeah. Thank you, Ma. Yeah, there's continuity, but also the expansion of interest. I think that's broadened. It opened so many areas no, that have been maybe not so popular areas uh, for research no, on Japan. And I think even Director Ben Suzuki, uh, when, he, when he was judging, I remember this. We had the, like, a very short conversation that, uh, how come there, there's no paper on anime <laughs> like, that made it to the finals? Or like there's no one talking about pop culture. And it's mostly policies that made it to the policy-based research that made it to the finals. But, but this is the, already the direction of Japanese studies as far as... Uh, but I guess I also influenced that because some of the finalists happened to be my students. But um, I think there's quite a number also that didn't make it to the finals, but were also, um, I think, relevant themes that they're not really cultural in nature. Um, and and um, I think uh, these expansion of topics on the study of Japan are, are welcome. I think these are welcoming change or, or, or expansion, as I said, a welcoming development in Japanese studies in the Philippines. Finally, Miguel. Oh, thank you, Dr. Salara. Um, since I did not, I have not the opportunity to be under one of Dr. Salara's classes since I'm coming from a, a constituent campus of the university, specifically UP Cebu, what I could probably share, aside from an academic uh, standpoint, is more of interest in learning more about Japan on a more um, serious level since I'm also, um, in, in my own campus, uh, there are, I believe like I could probably relate to two organizations or student organizations that are uh, in some way interested with these sort of issues. Like for example, we have a dedicated Japanese cultural organization called the Nichibunken, which facilitates our own cultural exchanges with Japanese students, as well as um, other events relating to like celebrating Japanese culture, be it by anime, pop culture, or by um, learning the language itself. And also, I also, I'm also part of the Campuses Debate Society, which we talk about on a much more serious level, um, cultural politics, um, social movements, and wherever, especially Japan right now. So I think the direction for how my batch of students, uh, our batch of students here, like my age, is that we're sort of leaning to like more of like, from what I can hear is more of like past, history or relation to Japan since my campus has a history of being a pivotal uh, place for Japanese uh, occupation in Cebu. So like we're also tackling on like how um, like uh, probably like local politics in relation to like guerrilla warfare or like the Japanese occupation here. But in a much more lighter level, we'll probably talk about like uh, certain subcultures, like for example, kawaii culture, like fashion cultures, or like certain trends in Japan that are taking a hold of the younger generation over there. So I think 
even though they're not taking like in the same way as I am seriously, like Japanese studies actually researching it, I think they also like they're also trying to look beyond the pop culture, yeah, like referencing and like trying to relate to cartoons or like anime and start to look at how Japan is as a society beyond that. And that's something that I'm also eager to share with them whenever they ask or whenever they try to ask me about my own experiences here. So those are, I think that's how I would see it from my perspective. But definitely, I think even though no uh, pop culture theme papers do not make it to the Japanese studies research competition, that doesn't mean that uh, I think the interest in, in, in pop culture has died down. I think it's still relevant in so many uh, you know, parts of the Philippines, maybe not in the same impact, the same range of, of uh, I guess, impact or influence as maybe K-pop, um, because it's also way making it waves, no, in, in among Filipino young, younger generations, and I think that that another uh, I think adds another sort of uh, another area maybe of inquiry as to how to what extent there is some kind of competition or rivalry in terms of you know soft power, um, you know. Uh, if the impact of soft power diplomacy of between the two countries. And again, we can never, I think, get, get away from history because there's always some kind of, it, it will always, you know, we will always gravitate towards the historical, you know, um, relationship and, and historical past, you know, that sort of linked us to Japan and also Korea and its relationship to Japan and things like that. So I think history will be a staple in how we look at, you know, we, we study Japan as an interdisciplinary, you know, area studies. Um, all right. Um, as much as I want to accommodate more questions, I think we have to follow strictly the time, uh, just like how the, a lot of Japanese would, you know, conduct activities or events so let's let's follow let's stick to the time uh, i'd like to thank our audience for uh you know putting some questions uh, in the q a box if you have time guys um if you want to address some of them feel free to do so because some of the questions are directly addressed to you please go ahead and do that at this point i'd like to call the director of the japan foundation manila by the way uh happy 25th anniversary once again uh to the japan foundation manila for this important milestone and you were part of shaping the academic uh, partnership between uh, the University of the Philippines and Japanese universities. Thank you very much for your support uh, all these years. Um, I'd like to call uh, Director Ben Suzuki to formally close our event today. Um, Director Ben. Hi. Salamat po, Sarerosan. Thank you for your big, big appreciation to Japan Foundation. Dr. Nakanishi, Dr. Yoneno, and I always um, call her Yoneno-san, and Dr. Piquero Barriescas, and fellow young scholars. Thank you for spending your precious time with us. Your presence and insights are invaluable and a true testament to the long standing connection between the Japan and the Philippines in academic exchange. We are also grateful, of course, to the UPHR Center, especially to Dean Sevilla and Dr. Serrero, and to all those who have been involved in organizing uh, this milestone event. There are many uh, findings for me in today's lecture. Actually, my first mission of Japan Foundation more than 30 years ago was to arrange the PhD study environment for Mr. Mafio, about whom Nakanishi Sensei mentioned earlier, he got Japan Foundation Fellowship which I was in charge in Tokyo headquarters. I heard from him about the great contribution from Inokuchi Sensei, famous political scientist and the faculty of Toyo Bunka Kenkyu Sho, Todai at the time. Also Dr. Saniel's papers about Japanese studies, a very valuable resources called a freshman as me. From these things, I record my early period as cultural exchange practitioner. As Dean Sevilla mentioned in this opening remarks, the first dispatchment of Japanese scholar was in 1920s in the era of American occupation. Oh, I found that from the beginning, our two countries strong economic relations were and have been destined, destined to have a global scope and sphere. I had a chance to take part in the, of course, first research contest. And I was so admired to find a broad interest in Japanese studies as discussed earlier, not pop culture only anymore. I mentioned in positive context, you know, but migration, multiculturalism, or existence, even future of agriculture and etc. as you witnessed, Kamina. It opened up, opened up my eye that Japanese studies here was own strategy, 
high scope and clear direction in the context of global sphere. In this context, I trust a great contribution by Filipino scholar currently and also from now on to the development of Japanese studies in this region. Today, I could verify my impression is reasonable after I learned historical background and many um, cornerstones. But also, I could also uh, understand firmly that the history of human relations were indispensable for both of two countries and heart to heart relationship which Prime Minister Fukuda declared 44 years ago at Mania Hotel were handed down up to now. Fukuda doctrine is a very important for us, not only for Philippine Japan relations, but also for whole public diplomatic strategy. And more than that, for showing the spirit of mutual understanding, which is crucial when we make relation with others. Usually a doctrine by a politician is overwritten after the change of the region. But the Fukuda doctrine is exceptionally still cited by many people, including scholars. Academic relations symbolized those between UP and Todai is one of the evidence and successful case of this doctrine. And I think all of you at present today have that same genetic similarity. I hope we can keep a peaceful relation for good as Nakanishi Sensei emphasized on at the closing of his lecture. I deeply appreciate your attendance and participation again. Maramin, maramin, salamapo. Domo, arigato gozaimashita. Domo, arigato gozaimashita, Director Ben, for that very warm closing remarks. We ended, you know, we started warmly through the message, welcoming message of Dean Sibile, and we're closing also equally warmly. Thank you for that. Um, and before we close, I think uh, uh, Deputy Director Wataru Abe has some announcements to make, maybe some upcoming events of the Japan Foundation, and uh, maybe some invitation for the next research competition. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Amina san, arigatou gozaimasu. Uh, my name is Watarabe, the Deputy Director of the Japan Foundation Manila. Uh, thank you very much for today. Uh, to later, later, I would direct this message uh, on behalf of the Japan Foundation Manila. Uh, thank you to our distinguished speakers, to the UP Asian Center, and to our viewers. Uh, the pandemic is not yet over, uh, so I wish everyone to stay safe and healthy. Uh, as Joe Sensei uh, said now, uh, we, the Japan Foundation, uh, will co-organize uh, the Japanese Studies Research Competition, uh, the fourth uh, competition uh, this fiscal year, uh, as well as the last fiscal year. And uh, the call for announcement uh, will be published uh, this month. So uh, look, please look forward to the announcement. And uh, we look for the uh, get the many papers uh, from the uh, student all over the world. Uh, so, yoroshiku onegai itashimasu. And uh, JFM, uh, the Japan Foundation Manila, uh, will continue to conduct uh, programs and events uh, that fosters mutual understanding uh, between Japan and the Philippines. Uh, shifting online has made our programs more accessible uh, to everyone. Uh, while in our homes, especially to our upcoming Japanese study research competition, uh, we look forward to your support and participation. Uh, marami, marami, salapat. Uh, domo arigato gozaimashita. Domo arigato gozaimashita. Uh, Wataru san, thank you so much for that info. And we shall post the call for papers uh, starting next week for the fourth Japanese studies research competition on the Japanese studies in the Philippines. And uh, for a twist, we are going to accept papers, as Wataru san mentioned, we are going to accept papers from Filipino students outside of the Philippines uh, for this cycle. So we look forward to a lot of interesting papers. Uh, please, if you have attended today's uh, event, please circulate this announcement uh, to your uh, colleagues, to your friends, um, fellow students who might be interested in joining the competition next year. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. And uh, I hope that uh, everyone should stay safe and healthy because we're still in the midst of the pandemic. And uh, hopefully uh, we will be uh, seeing you again 
for the fourth Japanese Studies Research Competition next year and the upcoming events of the UP Asian Center. With that, uh, good afternoon to all and thank you very much. Maraming salamat.